Voilà, mesdames et messieurs. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, controversy uh, number six of the 23rd uh, Encontre Economique of Aix-en-Provence with two uh, well-known people uh, who uh, characterize risk and progress, the, the history past and present, Etienne Klein, historian and physicist, and Thomas Verbal, the CEO of uh, AXA, the worldwide uh, insurance group, of course. Thank you very much, both of you, for being with us. Uh, Etienne, we're going trying to see uh, what impact risk can have on uh, progress. Uh, when I was asking you what is progress and we can link progress to risk, in a country that has uh, been through the Enlightenment with Condorcet and D'Alembert and others. Yes, hello everybody. The answer to the question would require several hours of discussion to be uh, to simplify a little bit. I would just like to quote Emmanuel Kant, who wrote a book in the 19th century, which uh, the uh, title of the book is uh, "What Are the Lights?" And the answer was that the idea of progress is an idea that is doubly consoling, and he adds, sacrificial. What does he mean by this? It is consoling because it enables us to think that our children will have a better life than we have. And it consoles us for the unhappiness of the present, but it, he adds that it is also consoling because it gives a meaning to the sacrifices that it requires. In other words, when you believe in progress, you have to agree to sacrifice yourself in the name of a certain philosophy of history. To say it in one sentence, believing in progress is accepting that you will sacrifice your personal present in the name of a collective future which has been configured in advance in a credible and attractive way. So this is the uh, to show the, how we, much we have changed compared to the situation that Kant uh, describes. I read the articles that were published in May 1842 at, in France, at Madon, there was a major railway accident in France. The first major railway accident between Versailles and Paris. There was a derailment of a train that caught fire. The doors were closed to unlock to prevent people uh, committing suicide because people were committing suicide by jumping off the train, off the bridge onto the train. There were several uh, hundred and fifty people killed. And there were several hundred people were injured. And of course, the uh, press launched a whole debate about whether it was reasonable to use a, a, rail, a railway, uh, a train. The accident occurred on the 8th of May, 42, and three days later, this is what you can read of the newspaper of the day, Meudon is one of these exceptional unexpected accidents, but the population should not be frightened since technical progress and additional precautions should make it possible to avoid them. Four days later, the, journal, the newspaper of Rouen says the disaster of Rouen should not put us off using trains. We should take more precautions and we need to learn from this uh, disaster. The debate was acted upon by Le Martin, who was an MP at the time, on the 11th of May 1842 in the chamber. Uh, he talked about the accident and ended his speech by saying we should feel feel pity for them and feel pity for ourselves, but let's, let's continue. In other words, it's not just a single accident that should prevent the march of progress. I think that our relationship with risk today has completely reversed. In other words, now we, we do not refuse the, to associate risk with something that is a sacrifice, so that uh, the risk is no longer seen as a price to pay to have something that is an improvement, but on the contrary, as a symptom of uh, an overall uh, disorganization that has to be corrected. Thomas Bell, when we listen to Etienne Klein, we think that we realize that the risk has followed progress. Progress was put in place, we think about uh, railways, and of course we all remember this terrible accident which uh, led to a lot of uh, articles being written. Would you say that insurance, by definition, is there to, uh, in fact, that you insure risk? Does this mean that uh, it has to follow risk and not precede uh, progress? For me, it's the other way around. For me, progress is the result of taking risks. And I'm very happy that during our debate uh, here, we have a lot of people talking about the subject of progress, which has been forgotten a little bit. 
because if we look at uh, our customer base and the society in general, we do a report on future risks every year, and, if we, and we see the following subject. The risks around us are increasing, the re societies are becoming more and more vulnerable, they do not want to take more risks, and our societies have less and less trust in institutions, in other words, uh, enterprises, to resolve these risks. At the same time, we are confronted by new risks, which we've never seen before, the pandemic, the climate uh, transition, and uh, cyber, and we have to do something. And I think we are, are now at a very crucial point with a great reversal of the risks in our peoples. But nevertheless, with a good understanding of the risks around us, and we know we have to do something. So insurance is always at the center of this, because if we remember the history of insurance, I'll give you a little history lesson. It was the sailors at the time who said, we are putting capital together. It was Lloyd's at the time, because the loss of the vessel is so penalizing for one of the entrepreneurs. If we share this risk, it's much better. In other words, risk taking is not done at any price. We have to take risks that are measured, but we have to take these risks in order to make progress. I'd like to also ask Etienne about the future and risk in a specific French case. Is there something I think is very important? There's a cyber risk. We have been through the health uh, pandemic uh, with an identified virus, and here, Mr. Burble, we have the impression that with uh, cyber, with a cyber risk, it's like a digital pandemic which might contaminate the whole of the IT system. So by assuming such a risk will be a, a phenomenal undertaking, it's a new risk, as uh, quite right, and it's uh, digital in the digital uh, risk, which we've never seen before. The classic mechanism of uh, risk uh, sharing is that with our three of us, each one of us is going to put some money on the table, and if one of us is ill, this person will take the money and the others remain in good health. With the cyber risk, everybody is sick. Potentially all at the same time, yes. Because with the connectivity we have, this is what is going to happen. So for me, there are two solutions to look at. First of all, how can we create more private uh, public mechanisms to, to plan for such uh, events, a public-private partnership? These don't exist at the moment in insurance. We see these sometimes in uh, uh, disaster management, but not in the cyber area. But then we need to see, think about how we can do a lot more prevention to, first of all, avoid and reduce risk and better manage risk, and also to be fully prepared when the risk occurs. Because it's not a question of if it happens, it, when it happens. Etienne Klein, digital artificial intelligence, all of these are real uh, uh, representations of progress, which are pushing us uh, to progress even further in intellectual terms. Yes, uh, you are distinguishing between progress, which is a kind of ideology of beliefs, in a way, because for progress to occur, you have to believe, because if you don't believe, you don't do anything for it to take place. Progressism is a kind of uh, pushing mechanism, which means we're constantly innovating. I'd like to talk about uh, the concept of risk. Why is it a risk called a risk? an English sociologist called David Fleming, who invented the principle of reverse uh, assessment of risks. The idea he defends that for us as human beings, we consider that a risk, uh, for us to consider a risk a risk, we have to be able to imagine the measures that will reduce the risk. Measures uh, at the design level in terms of prevention and technical uh, solutions. If we can't imagine a way of reducing the risk, the risk is no longer a risk, it's part of the human condition. This definition makes the risk uh, proliferating because we can always imagine a measure that can reduce a certain risk or another risk, and we are obsessed by the idea of reducing risks. Another thing I wanted to say about the idea of risk is that it is different from uh, danger. Risk is not the same thing as danger. There has to be a probability of exposure, for example, of a mountaineering. Those of you who never go to, into the mountains, mountaineering is not a risk because the probability of uh, fall is reduced to zero because 
uh, somebody who doesn't go mountain ring isn't going to have any risk of falling. So the risk, notion of risk is quite subtle and today it's, it has come proliferating for the reasons I've just explained but also because technology is entering every part of our lives because of digital technology but also because our worry and concern in, penetrates everywhere and the fact that technology and concern both infiltrate themselves into our lives means that the uh, idea of risk is ever present and leads to a form of anxiety which has been perfectly well documented today. The last thing I'd like to say is that I saw in the programme that the word progress is involved in a lot of the controversies and uh, roundtables but if with a roundtable and using technology you look at the presence of the word progress and the frequency of use in public discourse we can see that in fact the word has completely disappeared. It started to reduce in 1980s in the rate of uh, use and then it's now it's been com completely replaced by innovation and uh, I think this is the my th thesis that I want to defend the fact that we've replaced the word progress by the word innovation which seem to be synonyms in fact does not do justice to the idea of progress and in addition it creates additional anxiety why is that because the idea of progress was based on the idea of time that was passing that is constructing something. Time is our ally. It is helping us be free and uh, helping us accomplish our uh, will. That was the idea of progress. And so we configure the future in advance in a credible and attractive way and we work hard to make it become a reality. Innovation on the other hand, I won't uh, go through the whole history of this word, but innovation is a word that paradoxically is attached to conservation. And the word appeared in uh, lower Latin in the 12th century, uh, it was called uh, what we called an innovation was something you had to change in a contract for the contract to become valid because of a change that had occurred in the somewhere in the contract. So, uh, in fact, that day was a question of changing, so nothing would change. And the word has kept this meaning today. It's the critical state of the present that, ju that justifies innovation. We have to do this or that to prevent the world being uh, collapsing and not to creating a new world. So implicitly, innovation is based on a concept of time that is passing, but is more corrupt corruptional. The more time that passes, the worse the situation becomes. And so we have to innovate to keep the world in its current state. And implicitly, this is something that creates anxiety. Thomas Wilberling, concerning the idea of a risk, there's one subject that strikes me, and you have these double, these two cultures, you know, both German and French. In French law, in French constitution, since uh, Jacques Chirac inserted it in the constitution, we have the idea of the precautionary principle. We've talk, been talking about progress, innovation, and covering risks. The fact that, and here I'd like you to have this double approach, Franco-German approach. The fact that we have uh, part of the French constitution that incorporates the idea of a precautionary principle isn't this a way, although you can ensure a risk, isn't a way of perverting progress and perhaps even innovation. For me, this isn't contradictory because for me, a precaution is linked to the controlled risk taking. We shouldn't take any kind of risk. You have to know what the risks are and see how you can better control them, either by sharing them, you come together and you try to diversify, or you work on the prevention to uh, prevent to uh, prevent the risk. So prevention does work. We confronted with a lot of natural disasters, and I'm sure you remember the Katrina hurricane at the time, which cost the double of the Yan hurricane, which had the same dynamic and the same path, which occurred last year. This means that more or less we have divided the costs in two because in that period of eight or ten years, the uh, states and the citizens uh, invested in prevention. And it has worked. I think today we've probably forgotten that now. If I look at our customers, they are perfectly prepared to invest in uh, prevention of uh, their car breaking down, but they are not ready to invest uh, in their health and prevention of risks in companies. We have to change the way people look at risks and the precautionary principle also means that you have to alert people about the risks and this is what they can do, what they can do to reduce these risks. 
with risk taking and risk management is not the responsibility of the state or somebody else. It's up to all of us to be aware and to be active and uh, fully participatory in risk management. Thomas Bell, let me be a bit direct. I hear a lot of people, a lot of company leaders and business leaders uh, from the insurance world talking about the public-private partnerships and calling for these kind of partnerships to ensure the new risks, especially the cyber risks. Sorry to be so direct and a bit ironic, but is this to help the insurance companies to take risk with their margins by sharing the risk with the gate, or is it because the risks are so huge that the insurers won't have the means to cover the risks? It's the second uh, one is the answer. The risk of the pandemic, uh, a digital pandemic or a cyber risk is a systemic risk. I'll come back to my example of us three. Let's say all the three of us break down all of us at the same time. This means you have to have somebody who has to help us. That has to be the state. On the other hand, the cyber risk is uses a prevention a great deal because if today a company is protected from the inside and from the outside, and if we avoid something from happening, this means we can reduce the cost and the risk. I think the three parts have to work together, each one in its own corner, with their aligned interest to find a solution. Today, we can fully understand the problem, but we haven't yet found the solutions. Etienne, just a few words. Earlier we were talking about innovation shouldn't be confused with progress. Isn't it perfectly normal, in fact, that we should confuse these two things? When we you know that we have a rep, uh, candidate erected twice in France who talked about the startup nation, without innovation you can't have progress. Yes, I think that's for other reasons. The Enlightenment philosophy, which makes the word progress, uh, which has given it the meaning it has today, the word to progress is a very old world word which had a spatial aspect. When you talked about progress, it meant an army was moving forward in space. And in the 18th century, we thought, well, we could, if we can move forward in space, perhaps we can also move forward in time and progress in time and improve over a period of time. That's where the, the philosophy of the Enlightenment invented this idea of the progress and theorized it. But it theorized it with a, in a very naive way. For example, Condorcet imagined there would be an automatic clutch system between the diff different types of progress, between scientific progress, which would lead mechanically to technical progress, which would uh, lead to material progress and moral progress and political progress. For example, in the Cyclopedia, in an article entitled uh, Geometra, which means a uh, mathematician, Talonberg concludes saying, take a tyrannical nation, train some geometers, some mathematicians, and a little bit later, the people will be freed of their yoke. D'Alembert uh, didn't know about North Korea, where there are oh, fantastic mathematicians. So it's not as simple as that. I think the course of history ever since the Enlightenment has shown us the uh, naivety of the definition of progress, which originally uh, uh, applied to the whole of the humankind. For example, in technical levels, it's impossible to uh, dispute uh, the importance of progress, but humanity doesn't live in the same conditions. There are huge uh, inequalities, and all of this makes us uneasy. And because we are uneasy, because we see that we're going to be going to the planet Mars when people are living and sleeping on the streets in Paris, we've abandoned that word progress, we've replaced it with the word innovation, thinking that in that way we were going to modernize the idea of progress. And in fact, in a way, we have betrayed it. So somebody who's a, who believes in progress, rather than abandoning the word progress, they should apply it to themselves. In other words, the question is, can we believe, should we believe or not believe in progress? And the question is, can we make progress with the idea of progress? Can we redefine it? And I have a solution which is based on my experience of thought. If you take a time capsule that contains some Enlightenment philosophers, such as D'Alembert and Diderot and Condorcet, and other uh, people such as Spencer. In this time capsule, you take them from the 18th century to 2023, and you get them to discover our world. Not straight away, because they'll go completely mad, but you put them in different situations, which you can imagine. And we try to understand what their situation would be in a particular environment that we could show them today. And you can quite clearly say there are cases where they'd be completely astonished and they would realize that they, we've gone much further 
than they could have imagined. And in other cases, they will consider that we have gone backwards. And if we take stock in that way, we look again at the idea of progress so that it becomes more suitable to the situation we're in today. Because if it's difficult to reintroduce this into the collective imagination, the difference between 18th century or 19th century or 20th century and now is that when a scientist talks about the future now, I'm not talking about scientists who are talking about particle physics or cosmology who continue to make a stream with the black holes and the pulsars and the gravitational fields. I'm talking about scientists who talk about the climate, about biodiversity and pollution. When they talk about the future, it's credible because they're scientists, but it's not attractive. So the idea of progress, which uh, assumed that the configuration of the future would be both credible and attractive, is no longer the case. When it's not credible, it's not attractive, and uh, the two go together. Uh, perhaps uh, we could take a couple of questions from the room. Artificial intelligence is everywhere. It's uh, an idea that will deliver progress, although it uh, led, led to a kind of uh, uh, panic in a way because people were thinking that uh, the jobs that we have today are going to despair in 10 or 5, 15 years' time. We don't even know what kind of training we need to give people so that they'll be able to find a job in 10 or 15 years' time. What about uh, the training, for example, in calculating risk-taking? Is that going to be something that's going to be extremely useful or uh, is it an innovation that completely uh, goes beyond what you can do? Today we are in a phase where we are opening up a beehive and the bees are flying in all directions. We don't know which bees are going to sting us and which bees are going to be nice to us. It's really the, an exploratory phase of artificial intelligence at the moment. Once we have better understood how we can use it and where the dangers lie, not only the ethical dangers but a lot of other dangers in terms of criminal activity as well, I think then we will be able to realize that for some of our sectors there are huge advantages to be gained. On one hand, we can automate a great deal. In other words, people who work with customers can spend, can listen to the customers much more and deal with the real problems of customers instead of having to waste their time in administrative tasks. But on the other hand, the risk management and prevention with all of the massive amounts of data are going to open us up to us lots of opportunities. Today, for example, we already have companies who improve uh, planting and to carry out thermal uh, renovation to show people where fires are going to occur to reduce the risk of fires. That's not going to work if we don't use the power of data and the power of AI. I'll take some questions from the audience. First of all, a question for you, Etienne. When we talk about uh, logical progress, is that going to lead to economic progress and social progress? So in reality, it's a central question in a country like ours, because uh, technological progress, if it doesn't lead to economic and social progress, in reality, in medium term, people will refuse technological progress. It doesn't give them any extra well-being. It's quite... It's important to link uh, the past with the present. How do we measure progress? What I'm worried about is that if you read uh, D'Alembert's uh, and Didio's encyclopedia from the end of the 18th century, which is illustrated by figures and illustrations which explain how at the time the technical objects functioned, and when in the introduction to the encyclopedia they explained why they did this, made this choice of explaining technical objects in agriculture, etc., they say more, the more technology is used in people's everyday lives, as they call it, the more technologies will be familiar and the more the scientific principles that make them possible will be known to the people. In other words, to sum up, technology will be a vector for ed scientific education. That might have been the case at uh, certain periods. Now it's completely uh, wrong because the most complex objects which are familiar to us are so easy to use and so user-friendly that we don't need to know how they work in order to use them. And so, paradoxically, technology moves us away from science. And the question is, are we going to continue being the masters of a technology? Though to be able to understand it, you have to know a lot about science. You don't need to know a lot about science in order to use it. So, Thomas Bebel, your question for you, you've raised, uh, talked about the cyber risk. There's a question that says, Thomas Birbel, 
talks about this uh, cyber risk, and yet the media are always talking about the climate risk. Isn't it also important for a group like AXA to, uh, or not? What is the biggest risk? Is it cyber or climate? We always tend to talk about climate, or is it both, perhaps? As I said, we do uh, been doing a feature risk report for the last 10 years. Over the last few years, we've, we always see, apart from the COVID year, when uh, the health risk was uh, first. Otherwise, it's always between the two, cyber and and the climate transition risk. These are the two major challenges we have today. We don't yet have an answer. And to come back to the question you asked Etienne, I think it's important to bring our societies towards something where people can see they will increase their well-being and will bring them advantages in their everyday lives. For example, uh, by fighting against cybercrime and uh, helping them with the climate transition. Today, I don't think we do enough. We don't do enough change management to help people to uh, enable us to benefit from progress. And this causes a lot of fragmentation. And we're still suffering from that today. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. If you could give a round of applause to our two speakers, Thomas Merble and Etienne Klein.
Hello everyone, welcome. Please sit down. We will start and we'll talk about how to fund ecological transition at any cost. That's a wide subject. Maybe not at any cost, but the speakers will talk about it. There will be some sacrifices for sure because the price to pay will be high for France. Experts assess it to between 50 to 70 billion euros. To talk about it, we have the session coordinator, Bernard Curé. You're the president of the Authority of Competition, member of the ECB, and your economist. You're a member of the Cercles Economist. Then we also have among us Daniel Ball. We thank him for his attendance. You're the CEO of the CIC Bank. You had a few problems with your high-speed train. However, you're among us. Thank you for your attendance. You're coming straight from the train station. Thank you. Then we have Lorenzo Bini Smaghi. You are the president of the board of directors of Société Générale. Next to him, we have Florence Lussmann, president of France Assureur. And then next to her, we have Johanna Makoviak Pandera. You are the president of Energy Forum. Stephanie P, you are the general director of FSG. Uh, and then we have Philippe Sedbon, who is the, ch the chairman of AFG and the managing director of Asset Nostrum Management. So you are going to set the background of this difficult issue. At which cost are we going to fund this ecological transition? There are a lot of things at stake. We have public, private investments. What sacrifices should we uh, make? How can we apply the uh, which how we go how we should go from uh, brown to green basically how should we do this uh, transition hello everyone thank you for having uh, put this uh, important issue on the agenda because ecological transition is an important subject in a nutshell if the question is should we fund ecological transition at any cost the answer is yes that's the gist of it. We have no choice. It's crucial for our society. We have ahead of us something that is a light, a tantamount to an industrial revolution, but we have less time than we had for the previous industrial revolution. We need to, con to find investments to manage to have carbon-free uh, society by 2050 or uh, a reduction, a huge reduction of the uh, CO2 emissions, depending on the objectives that we set ourselves, but the objective is the same. The figures were given, the consensus is that we, in developed countries, we should have uh, 2.5 points of GDP per year by 2030. So for France, it accounts for 70 billion euros per year between now and 2030. Jean Pizani Seri and uh, um, uh, uh, they have described it as a substitution of capital t to a fossil fuel. We want to replace fossil fuels, and, f and uh, uh, as a substitute, we have to invest a lot of capitals in uh, new energies, and that will cost us 70 billion euros a year. The French debate is such that what is of interest to the political debate is only to know whether this uh, financing will be uh, in uh, the shape of tax or debt. But we're talking about something else altogether. And we're talking about private uh, funds. Can they be mobilized to avoid debt or to avoid increasing taxes, even though maybe at the end we'll have to do both? but we will discuss the alternatives. And I'm thinking about this wonderful uh, sentence from the German socio-democrat uh, saying, we have uh, as many markets as necessary and as much state as necessary. So how can we change the financial markets for these 70 billion to be funded by save existing savings? The first question is, Amongst the 70 billion, what is allocated uh, between the private and the public sector? Another question at stake is how are we going to earmark this funding with the regulation, incentives, uh, tax regulations, but also the choice of the savers themselves? Are they ready and willing for their savings to be guided towards these projects? There's a matter of efficiency as well. 
maybe from the public side, what is the government's regime of assessment that will be that will make sure that it is well allocated, that the money is well allocated as it should. I was part of the recovery plan in 2021. We had a lot of difficulties to uh, differentiate between what was green and what was not, and it was hard to uh, see the difference between the two. We wrote it in diplomatic words, but the subject matter was this one. So there's a lot about a lot of debate on public uh, money spending allocation, and we want to make sure that the projects that uh, favor innovation are the ones that are being um, funded. That's my job as the competition authority, and we also launched an, a, a larger investigation survey on uh, e-cars, on e-vehicles because there's a lot of uh, public spending that was allocated and want to make sure that it's structured in a way that is good for innovation and for the market. So um, efficiency is at, at, at stake. In Europe, we have another project that you all have forgotten, certainly, because it's a bit nowhere. It was called the Union of uh, Capital Markets. The aim was to unify capital markets in Europe. It wasn't taken seriously by European governments. My conviction is that if we do not do a union of capital markets, we will not be able to have ecological transition. So concretely, what are the priorities in the months to come or in the years to come? I'm stopping here. Thank you, Benoit. Let's have a round of applause. So before starting our roundtable, we've, we've started already, but I wanted to say that you can ask questions if you want. We will have a Q&A session at the end. So do not, uh, do not um, hesitate to ask any questions. Joanna Pandera, you're the president of the Energy Forum. That we have to do more. The cost of inaction today is high, but uh, you told us that uh, it's, uh, the other costs are enormous too. Thank you very much for the invitation. I establish and run a think tank which supports energy transition in Poland, which you may uh, know is not the easiest country when it comes to reaching climate neutrality. And I would like to make a few points because I was struck also with the numbers you provided about the cost of energy transition in France, 70 billion euros. And for me, it's just a question, put the cost into perspectives. Uh, the first point, like uh, how much we will pay if we will not transition away from fossil fuels, if we will not reduce the emissions. And just giving you the numbers which strike me very recently is the cost of energy imports in European Union. Last Only last year it was 700 billion euros. This is uh, the amount which is spent on importing fossil fuel from fossil fuels, mainly from outside of the EU. We, we faced uh, a structural deficit so we need to address it and also last year only subsidizing energy consumption in order to overcome the crisis we spent 800 billion euros. This is more or less the amount which uh, US government uh, prepared for clean investments uh, within the Inflation Reduction Act. So these are the numbers and context which we also need to understand that uh entire and reaching climate neutrality is not only about climate change, it's about energy security, it's about industrial policy, it's about answering the question how we will actually produce our energy in future once we don't have a big amount of fossil fuels. So this is this is the in for me very valid question, which by the way is now very much works in Poland. Poland is not the richest country in Europe. However, we must move away from coal because coal is over. This is this is the reality. Gas has its limitation. It was uh, named as a transition fuel, uh, but with the Russian invasion in Ukraine, uh, we decided in Europe embargo Russian fossil fuels, so also the prospects of using gas in future are limited. So then it's the question actually which kind of resources can play the role. And here I would like to a little bit discuss with what you, Benoit, said that uh, uh, that uh, 
at each cost uh, energy transition. I think it is up to us how we shape the cost. I'm, as a think tank, we are modeling uh, since many years uh, different costs and we see everything depends on the assumptions and everything depends on the decisions which government will take and how will it, it will prioritize, in example, different uh, policies. And in that context, what I think is very relevant is energy efficiency first. Once we start with energy efficiency, then the cost will be lower and the last sentence is it's of course uh, I think we we should do everything what we can in order to minimize the cost. But what is relevant is actually, uh, my feeling is uh, that we are not missing funds. We are not missing capital. We are missing the discussion on how to redistribute the cost of energy transition among different groups of energy consumers, also poorer households. There is a lot during this conference about energy poverty and fairer distribution of cost of energy transition. And this is something what in my view, we should really focus on now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you very much. Daniel Ball, you are going to talk to us about how we're going to fund this uh, ecological transition. At the same time, you're going to tell us that there are opportunities and sacrifices. Maybe there are solutions that you have set up in, uh, in your own institutions, something that is called societal dividends. So you are going to talk about it, and we want to know more about it, definitely. Please talk closer to the mic, all right? Hello, everyone. Sorry if I arrive late. If the question uh, is, uh, of course, obvious, we should fund the ecological transition at any cost. This is something that we should have done 30 years ago, and we'll have to do it in 10 years now. So it's a real subject. As a bank, obviously, we have a responsibility which is very specific in that field. As a uh, purpose-driven uh, company, we also have a role to play. As a CIC, we made the choice to have a purpose. and basically to create societal dividend. I'm going to talk about it straight away because you're asking me about it. Uh, what is being a purpose-driven company? That means making choices, choices for the company, for the customers, but choices also for the common good. And if there's a subject that is concerning everyone, it's the ecological transition. This is dear to all uh, to our hearts. So we decided to allocate 15% of our net consolidated P&L results in a sustainable way to what we call the societal dividends. What does it mean for this year? Bearing in mind our results in 2022, which was 3.5 billion, it's 525 millions that are allocated earmarked to this societal dividend that will be allocated to different pillars, half of which will be allocated to investment for companies or for a, um, a stock uh, purchase or for environmental considerations or societal considerations. That means that we do the same job as equity firms. The only difference is that the investment will be made depending upon the impact that they will have and not depending upon the profit that we could have. This amount of money will be aimed at funding the ecological transition. So there are companies investing in that field. Our decision was made in January and uh, when in September we'll be able to announce the first investments that we will make. That's a big change, right? We are going to invest depending on the impact and not the profit. Well, yes, and, and within us we also have an equity firm that works in a more traditional way as well that requires to have an investment on return, an ROI. So here we are going to select credible projects, that is what is important, and to see whether they are really green and not just greenwashed. So we need to be uh, very uh, rigorous in our vetting process. 
and will try to have a, uh, a horizon in the um, in eight ten years something that we wouldn't do with an equity firm there are two other components the first one is in sponsorship and we've uh, launched a call for projects related to biodiversity this call for projects was launched on the april 15th and we've received 285 applications and we will process them for sponsorship purposes and there's another component regarding subsidies directly allocated to customers to allow them to act in a more proactive way for the lifestyle transportation insulation of her household for instance we took a uh, a, uh, we launched an initiative which was quite well observed, namely a 0% loan for the purchase of a bike to change one's lifestyle, to uh, go towards soft mobility. And as I often say, it's good for climate, but it's also good for health. So this is for the societal dividends. But for the rest, as a bank, we know that we have to assist all our customers, individuals, companies in their environmental transition, in the uh, loans that we have to grant. And already now we are granting loans at more favorable conditions depending upon the what is at stake and the commitments that are being uh, made by the companies and individuals. That is our role. And I often say it. The aim is not to be census, but rather to be of assistance, and this is important for us. Thank you. We will now follow up with you, Rezo Yeah, We can applaud uh, Dan Daniel. Lorenzo. Lorenzo Binismaghi, you're the president, uh, the chairman of the board of directors of Société Générale. You are going to talk to us about the cost of transition, the difficulties encountered, and maybe this European coordination that needs to be implemented for, in terms of instruments to uh, favor access to uh, ecological transition and everything that we have to do to speed up the funding of transition because there's some kind of friction now that um, maybe that, uh, that leads to a lot of stumbling blocks. Three uh, key messages. First of all, a transition has a cost, we've said it. It will cost much more than what we think because it's not only a matter of transition. There's a matter of adaptation as well, adjustment. So when we will have, I don't know how, how many degrees, I don't think we'll have the rencontre économique in the same way that we organize them today. It will require a lot of investment, so we'll have to organize them elsewhere in another venue. Why am I saying that? Because when we delay transition, as we've done for so many years, we accumulate, we aggregate CO2, and each year is worse. So the cost is getting higher every year. So we need to think about adjustment of our lifestyles to different temperatures, to higher temperatures, and full areas of Europe will be desertified. Another message. And I, I'm not going to be optimistic because you can all say what you are going, what you're doing right now. But Europe will encounter a lot of problems, and maybe we won't make it. We won't make it in uh, funding the transition because states are over indebted. We'll have to increase taxes, and if we were to do a referendum now, who is willing to pay more taxes to fund the ecological transition? I will not see a lot of hands being raised. Are there a few hands raised though? Well, we have to understand what it means. When we think about the private sector, funding needs are significant. But bearing in mind the financial system that we have in Europe, which is bank-based, they can grant loans if they have capitals. And they can only have capitals if they make profit. But we know that there's a limit. So it will be very difficult for a financial system such as the one we have in Europe based on banks, where we fund everything via banks, and we don't have any capital markets. We have 27 capital markets that are very small. And as Benoit said, as long as we do not have a full-fledged European uh, cap mar capital markets, we won't be able to fund everything that is necessary to op to proceed with the transition. We won't be able to be competitive as opposed to the US. Because the US, first of all, 
they have a financial system that is well developed, well integrated, and they have a very efficient instrument in tax reduction, basically, to create investments. And taxes are paid at the federal level, not at the local level. In Europe, we each have our budget, so the tax base for to create an incentive for investment is very different from one country to another. It's true that the American plan is very beneficial. Well, they, they create their own interests yeah, with the instruments that they have available. We do not have the instruments. We don't want to create them. We are very shy. We are thinking in silos. And we're not ready to be competitive. With, uh, as opposed to the Americans. And the last message that I would like to convey is that banks can assist companies, households, but they, we cannot force them to do so. And in the end, we cannot have green finance and an actual brown economy. The initiative should come from actual economy, and we can help them to become green but we cannot force them to do so. And it would be an illusion from the regulators nowadays to think that we put constraints on the banks and the banks will implement these constraints and put these constraints on the corporations and the households. It won't work. My messages are not optimistic, but I, sh I should like to draw your attention to European uh, political decision makers and national po uh, political decision makers because every day it increases the cost of transition and the cost of adjustment to a changing climate. And at the end, this will uh, adversely affect Europe. Thank you. Florence Lussmann, you're the president of France Assureur. Maybe you have something to say about this. If uh, we have a lot of assets, we can't uh, only ensure green assets, we need to ensure brown assets, we need a timeline, we need, uh, and you have another prism, namely natural disasters, because this will impact your activity as well. Thank you and hello to everyone. Indeed, insurance companies for many, many years are at the forefront of climate change, so global warming is a reality for us. We see more and more natural disasters. And at the end, we pay, but these are, first and all, human dramas. A lot of people think about this psychological impact of natural disasters due to global warming. I could talk about the UNDP, the uh, United Nations Development uh, Program for Human Development. There was something that was done in Cambridge for one person that is affected by a natural disaster. There are actually 40 other people that are impacted. So the scale, the psychological scale, the mental health scale needs to be also assessed. When we talk about transition, we talk about uh, 50 to 70 billion euros for France, but there's also the cost of uh, lack of transition, and there's a lot of human costs. So you've understood that for us, transition is absolutely necessary and indispensable. So we work with our members, with our clients in terms of environmental transition, but we also invest 2,400 billion euros of investments. That's your money. That's the money that you uh, entrust us with. And this is where we invest uh, this money more and more in green investments, in sustainable development uh, projects. We have more than 270 billion euros that are green, uh, that are invested in green investments. When we talk about 400 billion, there's 1,900 uh, life insurance. So we, we have policies. So we need to ask the customers because when we sell a life insurance policy, we need to advise them. And when we ask them what they want, 60% they want to have meaning, to have a meaningful investment. And behind this, we'll find the ecological transition. But they also want safety. 30% of them want security, safety first and fall, and also cash. 
So we have to uh, be accountable for this. We're willing to do so, but we need to have a huge societal momentum to manage to have the right impetus to uh, invest this money as we should for ecological transition. What is lacking now? There's a plethora of uh, regulations. As like banks, we need to understand regulations. We think, OK, they will put the constraints on the actual world, their investments, but also via their insurance operation. This is what the regulators think. I think it's an illusion. That's not the right prism. It's not with this constraint that we will manage, because to find the investment amounts, the rightful investment amounts, we have to work on savings. We talk a lot about consumption, but when we think that we have to fund 50 to 70 billion euros every year in a country like ours where we have no pension fund, that means that investment comes uh, in the majority from life insurance policies, we need to do everything to favor development of life insurance policies. And on this matter, I have a few concerns about what is going on in France and also in Brussels, but we'll talk about it later on. Thank you, Florence Sussman. So, Stephanie Tay, you're the CEO of Natixis. You're going to talk about the role of these uh, financial stakeholders and those that are innovative. We have to go towards this transition. We have to help a lot of sectors, chemistry, um, iron, steel, um, glass, and a lot is at stake, isn't it? Of course, but transition has already started. It, maybe it's not fast enough, it's not extended enough, but it has started already. We also have infrastructures in terms of uh, renewable energies that has sped up. We have a lot of investments behind this. So investments of transition have started, as said. I'll say it again very swiftly because it's useless. But you have a panel of stakeholders that are concerned by the, the ecological transition are here. It's banks, insurance companies, the market. And the absence of a European market is a stumbling block today. Uh, to be powerful enough and efficient enough, there's no key, there's no wonderful solution, there's no miracle recipe for all this. And it's wonderful to see what has been done by CIC on societal dividend that you have well described. There are other ways to proceed. I remember the SNCF railway uh, company that has worked on uh, impact emissions. The, and it was invested in society and was uh, in social investment. There's a panel of solutions of stakeholders. We need to encourage companies that are operating this transition to speed up the, transi the transition that has started already. And I agree with what was said before. It's not up to the financial um, uh, stakeholders to work with on that. We've talked also about the tax measures that have been set up in the US. What is striking me, because we work on all continents, I could see how uh, that how fast the time to market was done. When we had the Emira in the US and the first uh, Emira we did at the time, it, it, four weeks elapsed only. And 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 for me, it's it's actually a, a cause for panic, because there's a lot of red tape in in France. Yes. We're still talking about what we should do, and they're already really uh, um, efficient and implementing. When they talk about gas, I don't, we don't know how they did. We know that 70% comes from from their own natural resources, but we could see this capacity to assist is really fast, and we're lagging behind, and we uh, are too slow. So a panel of stakeholders, a panel of uh, uh, solutions, and we need to improve the market operation in Europe, and we need to move faster because, of course, we're all talking a lot about transition and costs, but there's an emergency. We need to find the means to do so. Thank you, Stephanie. Stephanie, thank you. Alors, on termine. So we're going to end this uh, first uh, turn around all of our participants. We end with a specialist in uh, investment, uh, who you are the last one here. Philippe Sedbon from the uh, chairman of APG. How are you going through this uh, transition yourself? You say you can't let the brown assets to use uh, ground green assets. The question of a yield and uh, 
Uh, although this isn't what you came out the first time. You said you people uh, savings wanted uh, secure savings, and they also want them to have some yield as well. Yes, absolutely. Hello, everybody. If we go back to the theme of the theme of the Onkot uh, Economica renewing hope, I can see two subjects which uh, can renew hope. First of all, there's no debate about the fact that we need a transition. There could be a debate about that. Other countries aren't following it. And you could say, well, you need to have a sudden change. And you suddenly change, switch over to everything being green tomorrow, which obviously would cause huge uh, social crises and which isn't possible. That's so important. There's no debate about the need for the transition. And the other point that's rather positive is that we've talked about the economic uh, challenges uh, in terms of funding. 60, 70, or 100 billion, perhaps it'll cost even more than that. Let's say 100 billion. The good news is that in France, we have 3 million, 3,000 billion euros of uh, savings. And we, have about, and we have about an extra 100 billion every year. So we have the money, you're saying. Now, I'm not saying that before we think about taxing people, perhaps we could earmark the savings. If we're talking about earmarking savings, faced with this challenge and this project, which is transition, this major project for the planet, any project does not, no question of intention, it's a question of execution. Let's, uh, let's talk about execution. I want to talk about actions that have begun already that were through our management association by this uh, active player. We're working with banks and with the savings institutions. Three floors to this. The first floor is to have a clear framework, a clear regulatory framework. We're working on this. We're making proposals because I'm convinced if we did a survey in the room today saying, what is your definition of the transition, it would be a different definition for each person. So we have to have a clear definition of what the transition and what a a transition plan is for a company. We've been working on this. We've made proposals, and this will come up with the the uh, new version of the uh, CFDR in 2026. This second point, this isn't enough. To, when we're doing our work today, and we have to continue doing this work of analysing, selecting, and funding the economic projects and funding the emitters. We were doing this previously using financial criteria only. Everybody had the same cash flow, the income, etc. Everybody had the same criteria today. In the same way, you don't have the same criteria and the same body of common indicators. That doesn't mean that conclusions have to be identical. We all have our different conclusions. We have to work on a common body of indicators. That's what the EFG is doing with the Institute of Sustainable Finance. So by the end of the year, we will have a proposal for a common body of indicators. Otherwise, we won't be working in the same direction. The third floor is, as you said, Isabel, is the profitability, the yield. You will have different life plans from my, from myself. You have to have products and profitabilities that are appropriate. I don't think uh, you're not going to have the same uh, requirements depending on who you are. So we have to select and analyze and fund the right projects, whether they're green and or only green, yes. But it has to produce profitability, and it will produce profitability. There's no doubt about that. When you invest, this uh, increases productivity, creates jobs, and will therefore create uh, profitability. It's your question of time. You have to give yourself the time to give uh, for the investment to produce the fruit of your action and to produce the uh, profitability that they will produce. I know that uh, in the, at the time of internet and Bitcoin, where things are very volatile, it's complicated, but we have to give ourselves the time nevertheless. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe Sedbon. Now, uh, perhaps another question, and after that, uh, we'll have some questions. What comes out of what you've all been saying is that there are difficulties, especially to know what is a green uh, asset. This is what you were saying, Philippe. There are a lot of different definitions of a, of a, a, a green asset. It's difficult to come to an agreement. Perhaps Benoit Curé, you have an answer on that? I think it's better to let the financial uh, players uh, tell us this. We're, this is a, uh, we're trying to be concrete and identify the uh, blocking points. What are the uncertainties that remain in the regulatory framework that prevent them from doing their work, from doing their job? In other words, to earmark the savings that they are given to all green projects and green assets. 
we have to what do we have to change in the regulatory framework so that this uh, great movement of earmarking the savings can begin immediately so Florence perhaps in the European level other things to do yes we have a number of labels the trouble is that these labels are not stabilized and also these labels like the taxonomy are rather static so what's happening if uh, all of a sudden we decide that there will be want to only invest in green projects. There are whole sections of our industrial economies which will suddenly stop, they will collapse. I mean, that's just not realistic at all. So that's why it's absolutely vital, and this is the case in the green industry law, to, to find on a common baseline on the base of a transition, what a transition plan. We have investment programs that are earmarked. One of them is the sustainable recovery in France. The conditions for the investments are that the companies have to be CSR with criteria for parity, etc., and also criteria on the ecological transition. And what can we see here? We can see that they have a lot of need for support. And this is what we and our asset managers are giving them, because today, in fact, nobody knows exactly what is a good transition plan. And what's going to happen? So we're going to say, I'm going to invest in this company because I believe in its transition plan. And the, the transition is the most important thing, because if the companies are already green, they've run, already done the job, but the brown companies have to become green and uh, not in the not too distant future. So today it's the responsibility of each insurance company and each asset manager to say, I believe in that, I'm going to go for it. So what's going to happen in three or four or five teams? We'll have a supervisor who will come along and say, no, that's rubbish, that's no good at all. It was obvious that this plan was not going to work. I'm waiting to speak to them today so that all of us together, we can get around the table, if possible, on a European level so that we can decide how we build so that a particular company has its own transition plan. And then, of course, we have to monitor the execution of the plan. But for me, that's the absolutely vital issue for me. Stephanie, then Joanna, you wanted to say something? Yes, to agree with what you were saying, there's a big difference between I'm financing a green asset. I can see what a green asset is. I'm finding wind turbines. Uh, which are properly built and will generate a green energy. What about the, f what is a green company? What is that? That's the difference. For five years at the Net Texas, we've been developing an internal indicator called the green weighting factor, which enables us to qualify the color of our portfolio with a transition plan. It's much easier to qualify the assets and to qualify the companies. So we need to have very clear and common definitions of what a green organization or green company is. Joanna? To respond what actually green investment is, there are certain rules which are written in the taxonomy uh, which very specifically describe the definition of, uh, of uh, green investment and there, there are also, there is very specific methodology on how to calculate carbon fruit, footprint. So I think that the main challenge for the financial sector is now to apply those rules which exist to be transparent, not to do the greenwashing and, and to scale up investments which are required. So this is the challenge to, to change, to shift into investments from those, let's say, business as usual to those who are key for reaching climate neutrality. Oui, Daniel, plus personne fait du, plus personne fait du greenwashing quand même maintenant, non? C'est fini. <laughs> I don't think anybody else, anybody's doing greenwashing anymore. Uh, what do you think? I'd like to be very pragmatic about the decision that a banker can take about a particular project or a company. I'm quite close to the operators and I know how that works. Today, the, when you are uh, analyzing an application for funding, the first and foremost, the most important thing in the financial criteria, but also systematically for us, we take account of ex non financial criteria. And that's how we take our decision. It's not necessarily more regulations that are going to help us to be more effective. We have a subject which is traditionally raised, which is what attitude should we have to oil companies? Should we continue funding oil companies? Our answer is to say quite simply yes, if they are investing today increasingly in alternative energies. For example, we've decided to stop financing new projects 
which will further increase the production capacity of oil and gas. Nevertheless, we're not uh, refusing to finance these companies entirely because they're also making efforts uh, to accompany energy transition. And Wenzhou, Lorenzo, there will soon be rules that will force major companies to publish their non-financial commitments. 50,000 companies are concerned, I think, Lorenzo? Yes. If I can just uh, differ slightly from what has just been said just now, the rules have been defined for the banks and insurance companies have to be applied and that's fine, everything will be great. No, it's not that simple. We're going to apply the rules, but the problem is that in opposite us, we have customers, companies and households as well. Because when you're talking about a financial loan, the loan has to be used to build or to use uh, how things are drawn online. You have the customer has to understand as well. The customer has to be green as well. And of course, that starts with the big companies, of course, but it's the same for everybody right down the line. There's no also for well the bankers and the insurance companies applying the rules. That's fine. Of course, we apply the rules and we try to help our customers. But the most important effort will be the level of the customers. We shouldn't deny it, that reality. That's where the greatest effort is needed. That's where the biggest cost is. It's uh, with our customers. That's where they, uh, they have to help them define a financial journey. And this financial journey will be complicated if, especially in Europe, we don't have the same fun tax incentives or financial incentives as in the US. Do you think there's an appetite for investors and for savers to want to make green investments? Yes, there is a demand, but we have to have the supply as well. The risk is greenwashing. If we try at any price to satisfy this demand by inventing investments which are not, in fact, green. So we have to be very careful. The responsibility of the financial players is to be more royalist than the king when they are applying these rules. But the effort, we have to explain this, the effort has to come from the real economy. The people, who are, the, those who are actually producing and investing, Philippe Setbon. Do you think this could change the situation, this need to publish this non-financial data? Yes, of course. But well, we've already been doing it for some time. Transparency on investment, of course, yes. In fact, we put the cart before the horse because we want to be transparent about investments. And we've been doing this using non-financial indicators, whereas the emitters don't yet have that obligation. This is a rather a specific point. I'd like to come back to it uh, just for uh, Talking about the earmarking of savings, the labels, of course, that give information for the, distribu for the uh, distribution activities. Uh, there are, it's taxation that can give guidance, but that shouldn't be giving too much guidance. It should have to be an accelerator, but it shouldn't give too much guidance. Otherwise, you have phenomena where investment is concentrated and you create bubbles and a negative yield, as I mentioned earlier. So we have to be very careful with that. And there is also the subject of how as we've all said, how do we move from brown to green and how do we support everybody? And for that, we need information. What you were saying, Isabel, is the regulations have to be exacerbated and have to force the companies to publish. That's absolutely vital. This publication is absolutely vital. We need information, all of us, to be able to analyze, select and finance. If we don't have this information or we only have it through providers of data and information who unfortunately, and that's because slightly because of us, they're no longer European, you can imagine the situation. You're transforming the European industrial fabric using information which comes from outside Europe. That's unthinkable. So we need that information. It's absolutely crucial. It's a question of sovereignty. Do you have questions in our audience? Yes, I can see lots of hands being raised here in the front here, gentlemen here. You could just introduce yourself if you like. Hello. Thank you for this round table. My name is Christophe. I'm a student at the uh, in Paris. I'd like to ask you about something that happened three weeks ago at the BU added summit on a new world pact. I announced new actions to finance the ecological transition of developing countries. I'd like to ask uh, you all a question. How do you think we can encourage the most indebted countries to finance their tran um, ecological transition. Who wants to answer that one? 
Benoît, non No? What we can say is that to finance the ecological transition, you have to have savings. And in those countries, you need to start trying to introduce the saving mechanisms and uh, popular savings, uh, widespread uh, savings for the whole population. And this has been the case in France for many decades. And this is also the case in insurance field as well. There are means of encouraging and uh, facilitating uh, savings. Then concerning the different uh, structures that can be set up, concerning uh, global warming and disasters, etc., I uh, talk a great deal to the major worldwide organizations, the, uh, uh, the IMF and the World Bank. Well, with the conclusion we come to for the developing countries and the less developed countries is that you need public-private partnerships depending on the level of uh, uh, equity of a financial company in a particular country. It can cover a number of risks. You can invest up to a certain amount. And then after that, of course, obviously, you need to have public finance. Bruno, did you want to add something? Yes. I think that if we want to help developing countries fund their transition and adaptation, which is an even greater challenge for them than for us, we have to have uh, chain, change the model for uh, the in the multilateral organizations i'm thinking of the world bank and the bui which is our multilateral uh, organization and the european development bank and the regional banks we have to give them money we have to give uh, have a change of intellectual sector we have to give them money but using a less uh, paternalistic approach than in the past and we have to avoid uh, a different approach or depending on what we allow for others and what we allow for developing countries. For example, the idea that CAS is a transitional energy in Europe but will stop uh, funding CAS projects in developing countries is completely incomprehensible for them. So we also have to change the software and to do that we no doubt have to change the governance of these institutions to give these countries a greater role. We'll continue on with the questions. I think are their hands being raised? Voilà, puis après il y en a une, la madame aussi. Merci. Bonjour, je m'appelle Sami. My name is Sami, I'm at Nord HEC in Paris. I've understood that there are two challenges is first of all information, what kind of city which is green, what company is green, and the question of incentives. I've understood that there are problems with uh, the uh, Transformation General, the companies have to put in place green projects and the partners are starting to put in place reforms with uh, they'll be able to start uh, carrying out thermal renovation. I'd like to know what you think of the economic proposals such as the conditioning of the rate of funding by uh, regional banks to the central bank, the presence of collateral, green collaterals rather than brown collateral, wouldn't that be a good way of incentivizing people to earmark savings for the ecological transition? Who would like to try that one? Daniel? Yes, I can start to answer that one, yes. Yes, uh, another layer of regulations. I'm not sure that would be really very effective. Maybe the supervisor is co-regulator is thinking of doing that. I think we should trust people. We should trust the different players, and the, uh, in, whether it's uh, banks or insurance companies. And as uh, Florence was saying earlier, uh, concerning the, the people, the savers, we have to see where they want to put their savings in. When the banks, when they give uh, uh, credits, they have to, they are able to orient the, these uh, loans. The idea is not to only be a, uh, we have to be an, uh, somebody who provides support. If we only do it because we have uh, excellent refinancing conditions with the central bank, they would be a bit too restrictive. This morning I was reading that one of the speakers, one of the roundtables, was saying that you need more regulations for finance. And, you know, it's just, and it's not just an ethical question. I completely disagree with that idea. And the idea of having more regulations in a sector where we always really have far too much regulation, I'm really not in favor of that because I really don't think it's the right, right uh, solution. We say we're in a free market economy, but for me, it's becoming less and less uh, free. But I do trust the banks, and we are one of those banks. I think in general, the French banks are responsible in their behavior, and they are capable, and they are committed today to support their customers. But, 
I'd like to add that you were mentioned the way you express this idea of favoring refinancing. The trouble is that all of these regulations, there's already too many regulations, I agree. It's just punitive. What, what we, uh, you're suggesting that we should degrade our work if we don't uh, use the right uh, mechanism. We should try to reverse the process and give, make people want to do things rather than punishing them. Any other additional regulations for me is a uh, negative uh, development rather than helping to promote uh, and finance uh, green projects and green assets. But, uh, I, I think that we, the major challenge is indeed to mobilize investment and how to do it. I think generally in the EU we set the targets, targets in order to mobilize investment. In Parlez, you, y a près du micro. Sorry? Ah, closer. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so so the, the challenge is that the, that approach, in my view, does not work. And where I think we can change a little bit thinking is through the public-private uh, uh, partnerships, uh, where uh, projects which are of the particular importance to the state, to the countries, can really get support, extra support of the state, and to merge it with private financing. I don't know to which extent it works in, in France. In Poland, there is a long discussion how to do it. It's still uh, a lot of um, space for, to maneuver, but I think it's, it will be really the key, because what I see, we are really missing good projects. So here, you're right, only prohibiting financing old projects project is not enough. We need to find good projects too. Il nous reste très peu de temps. On va prendre une question, madame. Là, vous aviez levé la main. We don't have much time left. Uh, madame, the lady here was raising her hand. Yes. Thank you. We only have two or three more minutes, then we'll have Benoit's conclusion. I haven't forgotten you, Benoit. Just uh, staying in France and not in the developing countries, for example, I would like to ask uh, the banks a question, particularly Société Générale. What proportion of investment and uh, have we done this uh, year for ecological transition? We haven't talked about that. What is the proportion of investment has been for ecological transition? We don't have a portfolio objective. We have objectives in terms of financing. We, are, we have the objective of renounce reducing brown investment compared to green investment. We don't have an objective, an absolute objective in terms of financing uh, green projects because the level of the amount, number of green projects is quite low. We have uh, objectives to support our customers so the green part becomes bigger, but we don't, we're not able to measure whether our customers are green or not. So we have, we have a methodological problem. So to uh, to do uh, unable we to do when able to do what you're suggesting, it will be happening in the future, but at the moment we don't have that uh, approach. Uh, as I was saying earlier, we can't invent the figures. The figures come from our customers. Are our customers green or brown? Today it's very difficult to know. We can define the investments but not the financing of a company. If this company, is it green, is it brown at the moment, today? We can't recover that, retrieve that information if the company doesn't give it to us. In terms of figures, I can give the figures from the CIC. We don't have a proportion of green compared to the rest. However, we are able to set objectives for increasing our financing aimed at enabling the uh, climate tra transition and the environmental transition for our strategic plan that we're going to define at the end of the year. We're going to increase by 35 percent. We already had a 35 percent increase at the end of last year as well. So we're really accelerating. But, but giving the proportion between one and the other, I agree with the previous speaker, it doesn't really mean much if we do that. For the asset managers, you've understood we are all involved. But it's much easier in asset management. We have a stock to manage. The company I'm in charge of, but it's true for all of the industries or most industries, 400 billion euros uh, are being managed. For all of most of those are under Article 8 or 9 in European Union legislation, so that corresponds to your question. So it's to say we're already doing it. The transition has, has already begun. Bruno, a couple of words to conclude. Yes, first of all, thank you very much, Benoit.
A lot of things have been said. I leave this discussion a little bit more optimistic than before in a context which is rather depressing, which is uh, this, uh, this uh, global warming of our lives and our economy. For the students in the room, they are going to have to deal with an increase of four degrees in the temperature, not us. This is the most important challenge that our societies have ever had to deal with. What reassures me is that finance is mobilized. It's completely a heart of the decision-making processes and regulations. That's the good news. But I have heard two, three major questions. The first question is, how do we move from a rationale of a yield to a rationale of impact? And to do that, the customers, the savers, people who are taking out loans have to understand that rationale and be prepared to do so. The second question the second fear, rather, is that we can see that amongst all these financiers, there's a fear that the politicians are handing on to, passing the buck on to the financial world what they should be doing. So financial world can do some things, but there needs to be a political framework and a regulatory framework, and they need to have a carbon price. The direction has to be determined at a level which can't be done by a financial world. It has to be done by politicians. And the, the financial world is asking the politicians to do that. The third question is what Europe can do can, when you look at what the US are, are already doing in terms of reform of the energy market. That's already being done. And also in terms of the reforms of the capital markets. Europe is the biggest market in the world and it's the second uh, reserve currency in the world as of a high level of savings. So what are we going to do to finance the transition today? Nothing at all. So what can Europe do? We have the European elections next June. I encourage you to ask yourself when you're choosing your candidate, what can Europe do to provide better support for the climate transition? So there is still hope. Thank you very much, everybody.
Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Hello everyone. My name is Jean-François Geffrier. I'm the moderator from Radio Plastic. Can we manage digital? So we have half an hour of discussions between Elisabeth Moreno and Jack Attali. The answer is obvious to all of you because you are you have uh, you know SSF Connect. So if you follow us on uh, the apps, you certainly are uh, IT geeks. And you can follow us with REAIX on the social networks. We'll try to have a framework for this discussion because we don't always uh, manage digital technologies. We are in more and more in a digitalized world, and we wonder that if uh, in uh, artificial intelligence we will reinforce this or not. You are a, a corporate uh, a manager. You are the uh, manager of a company. You were a former French minister, and you were also at the top executive management of Orange and uh, another company. Jacques Attali, you're a chief executive officer. You were a consultant of François Mitterrand. You are in Paix contre la faim, Eureka, the EBRD, and Objective Planet. You have three minutes to speak up. Have you personally the feeling that you, do you have the feeling that you actually master and have digital technologies under control? And Mrs. Minister, you have the floor first. It's far from being obvious, isn't it? First of all, hello everyone. I think it would be pretentious to say that we master digital technologies. We could spend as many years on that field. It goes so fast. It changes every day. So we should eat a humble pie here. And we should know that we, uh, we do not master everything when it comes to digital. But I would like to talk about something. This morning, I took the uh, six-hour train to come here. At that time of the day, everybody is a bit tired. And I was close to a dad. I was sitting next to a dad. He was with his child, who was two and a half years old. All the adults slept, dozed off. And you can see there were also children. And it was babysitted for three hours by cartoons on the internet. Obviously, there's no judgment in what I'm saying myself. As a mother, I let my daughter uh, drag too much time on her PC or her iPad. Why I'm telling you this, this is a reality that is quite concerning. And there was an Ipsos survey from 2022 saying that 43% of children be between zero and two years old used internet for entertainment purposes, 43%. And so that gives you an idea of the importance of um, managing, of having digital under control, because it has infiltrated all the spaces of our life. It can actually track us as a human being, the relationship we have with our own image. It transforms our relationship with education, but also the corporate world, the way we um, find information, we inform ourselves. And if we do not control it, then we could think, what kind of future are we going to have? There's not a day where we don't have a press article telling talking about the anxiety, the concerns we might have about uh, the development of digital. Because nobody wants to have to, to see their uh, bank account disseminated to everyone. You remember the health disclosures that were um, d uh, disseminated, or we can have uh, any clips, any videos. You can have uh, porn uh, sh uh, shame videos that are disseminated everywhere. Revenge porn videos that are disseminated everywhere. But we have to think that digital can also be a tool for progress. And we have to solve a large number of challenges that we have to face on a daily basis. May, may they be climate uh, change driven or societal change driven. We've never seen and never gone through such a fertile era. And this helps us to solve a lot of. Uh, uh, the problems of our society. How can we master this the digital world? We are in a region of the world, luckily, 
where there's rule of law and the regulation is very significant. So we can wonder as well, how can we regulate when the countries that are leaders and forefront runners in that field like the US and China do not always have the same interests or the same values as us. However, in Europe, we have GDPR. We worked on the Digital Service Act, and this is progress in terms of uh, uh, law and rights, and that helps us to master and have uh, digital technologies under control. I was talking about it with this, uh, when, I when I talked about this anecdote with the, uh, this young child. At the earliest age, may it be a girl or a boy, if we do not teach our youth but also those that are less young, what this digital world is all about, we will not make it because it's easy to say, but if we don't know what chain, blockchain is all about, what is quantic uh, computers, what uh, a chat GPT is, or a, uh, artificial in intelligence, then we won't make it. So I'm, I'm really utterly convinced that the digital tool is a tool made by human beings for human beings and we need to have the opportunity to master it to make it a more equitable world and actually uh, a world that is uh, where there's less anxiety and concerns Jacques Attali, i haven't said everything when i introduced you because i didn't want to impress our attendance here but you've also published a lot of uh, books uh, the World uh, uh, Guide for Use, and you will actually sign autographs at the FNAC just uh, nearby after this session. The Economy of Life, uh, published uh, by uh, Pluriel. And that's interesting because for you, digital world is actually a tool that can help both for life but also for death, right? Any technology may be used for the, the best and the worst. Technologies are just a hammer you can build, but you can also kill someone with it. Secondly, the digital technology started four centuries ago with Pascal. And as for the computers, it's only 70 to 80 years that it has been in existence, so it's not brand new. If we were to look into new technologies, those that we need to master before everything is too late, we have to look into Gen and genetics, and I will go back to it, and especially the articulation between uh, artificial intelligence and biogenetics, which is a danger, a real danger that is threatening and looming upon us. Uh, so this development is uh, changing a lot of things, and like other technologies, without any control, in a, in, a, in a very surprising way, like print industry, because at the end of 15th industry, it has changed a lot of things in a surprising way. It was against all expectations. And now it is speeding up and transforming the relationships between human beings. And it is also um, in, uh, inducing a concentration of power and money in the happy few's hands but also it increases loneliness because we're all closed up in a bubble. And if we let it go the way it goes right now, we will have a society of uh, lonelier individuals closed up in their bubbles with a financial power that is more and more focused between the hands of those that have the knowledge of all the data produced by these individual bubbles. These bubbles will be a source of wealth for those that will be in control of these bubble statistics. And that's the world as it is shaping up in the years to come. May it be in the US, in China, in Europe. For the individual, what does it mean? Well, it reinforces the narcissism, the individualism, and drugs as well, because digital becomes an addiction. The figures that you gave are even more aggravated by the fact that in some countries we spend more time in front of a digital tool than at school and even more time than with their own parents. So uh, there's a change in the shape of uh, work, of uh, leisure. We are becoming more and more narcissistic 
and it's and there's a huge political private machine uh, using all this that's one trend a second trend that we need to control is whether to know what is the use of digital is it used for oil companies to find oil easier then it's a disaster it's if the use is to find textile products that we will sell for one euros with technologies that will help us to trigger uh, uh, more attractiveness, then it's a disaster. If it's helped, if it's used to uh, create uh, um, artificial food, then that's deaf economy. But if it helps health, renewable energy development, culture, democracy, and diversity of media, then that's a good thing. So we need to know if it's useful for the economy of life or the economy of death. And if there's a third dimension, which is maybe the most dangerous one, this is when artificial intelligence is extended to the largest echelon, and it, it is combined with genetics. What does it mean? We're reaching a point where we can create new molecules with robots that create these new molecules from uh, data. Artificial intelligence helps to find the new molecules that will be used depending upon some criteria. And this is how we manage to have these new latest developments. The day where the artificial intelligence won't have any human control and will be a, a combined with a robot that will create molecules or internal cell in, in internal uh, manipulation, then we will be beyond any control. We won't have any, we won't master anything anymore. We'll be powerless. You, for some months, you've been talking about artificial intelligence as a new branch, a new reality of digital for the years to come. According to you, Elizabeth Moreno, you have a double hat. You were the Minister of Equality of Chances, but also the leader of IT and digital companies on the African continent. How do you foresee the digital world development? How will it uh, create more gaps and um, more divides within the society? Well. Mr. Telly is talking about the digital world as a hammer, but it just amplifies all the best and all the worst in the human being. Therefore, all the inequalities that exist today can be demultiplied if we do not uh, pay attention. For instance, I read Mr. Telly's book. We didn't talk about the economy of death, but it was not far from that. We can say that digital technology can be the, the digital of life or death because it kills today. Everything that is cyber harassment today, we've never had so much, so many suicides from uh, young teenagers today. And those that are from my generation, when we were bullied at, 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 at school, then it would finish and end at the doors of the school. But now we are being harassed during school holidays, at home, at night, during the weekend. So it can kill. And the digital can also exacerbate inequalities that are already in existence. You probably know to date that only 27% of women are in the digital world. Only 10% when we talk about cybersecurity. All the professions that are going to be created tomorrow will have a digital component whatever uh, profession, the most noble one, the less visible, uh, for instance, a cleaning lady will have to use an iPad to know which product they need to order, and so on and so forth. So bearing in mind that all the trades that will, all the occupations that will exist will have a digital component. If only 27% of women are working in this sector and only 12% go to higher education streams regarding digital, that what will happen for women for tomorrow's labor uh, market? And when I uh, uh, led uh, Hewlett Packard Africa, I was fascinated because the demography today is such that no state is, in, is capable uh, of creating enough schools and hiring enough teachers to teach. So you can draw the best from the digital world because we can be in Aix-en-Provence and attend conferences in Boston, in Singapore, or in Rio. And so digital can be used to include, but I don't know if you know it, but Facebook was recently um, 
reprimanded because when they were uh, 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 airline uh, pilot announcements for uh, jo jobs, they were sent in a majority to men and not to women. So if that happens for uh, jobs, then it can ha also happen for more serious concerns and for R&D in tomorrow's world. In Africa, I always thought that this fourth industrial revolution was the most popular one that we have all known. We're not all able to buy a train or a car, but we all have a smartphone wherever we are in this world. But when we don't have access to the network, when we don't have access to infrastructures, to research, or to information, or education, how can this continent develop? when we have extraordinary talents on this continent and we have creations and inventions that are incredible. And I'll wrap up with this. The mobile money was born on the African country. Why? Because there was no legacy, uh, the banking legacy. Not everyone has a bank account, and it could not be Credit Agricole or BNP that could invent this, because for them it's just a way to adversely affect their own p &L. So the digital will divide gaps more and more, and this is why we need to be more inclusive thanks to the digital. So artificial intelligence can actually uh, demultiply uh, possibilities. With chat GPT, we can talk to them, for instance. But to exploit the potential fully, we have to be specialists with prompts. Prompts are uh, uh, directives that are well expressed to obtain the results. So we need to have a, a very high education to be able to have the right instructions. Obviously, we need to, the, the software uh, development will be essential and will make it possible, we will we'll need to make it tra as transparent as possible. It is clear also that artificial intelligence allows us to uh, raise questions that one is only reserved to specialists and to uh, make the work that was normally allocated to consultancy firms. Mm -hmm. We have to know what are the best practices, what could be done elsewhere, that would be a significant change. In terms of education, you, as you said, it will be crucial. Because as you said, in Africa, education does not exist anymore. We, have, uh, we do not have teachers that are properly trained. And the digital world will be the only one that will enable to avoid uh, problems in Africa. We need to uh, earmark more means for education via digital, and we need to allocate more means to health as well. In education, we have school manuals. In Sweden, we withdraw them, don't we? No, we can't say that. It is used not for in an excessive way. It's not fully digital, but it is in the form of projects. And in Finland, in Norway, we understood that what was important was to have a project-driven approach as a driver for education. In Latin America, in India, in China, the uh, e-health, the e-probing, for instance, namely we circumvent the tradi traditional methods, like uh, for landline, what, this is what we did in Africa with landline, the uh, outcome is uh, very significant. There's a change that's very interesting. For instance, th now with a mobile phone, very simple one, you can calculate without learning how to count. You can read without learning how to read because the machine reads for you. And you don't need to write. You don't need to, to, to have learned any languages because the machine can translate for you. And we have a new smartphone model that was invented by a, a, a company from uh, the Côte d'Ivoire and Togo. And that contains all these innovations. And the change that it brings about is, is incredible. We don't need to know how to read. We don't know how to, need to know how to count, to speak foreign languages. And that will actually trigger a lot of problems at the brain level because it won't be used as much as before. And we won't need to know foreign languages because we need just to put the smartphone and the smartphone will speak in your stead. And so we will be closed up in our culture at the detriment of uh, 
Western uh, cultures. So the natural trend, if we, uh, it will be to lock us up, to close us up, and not to open up to the others, and will become more and more individualist. And it won't be, um, it will be at the detriment of a common project, of a shared, of shared values. And that's the problem with technologies. We reinforce, we speed up the uh, epinatural trends. And there's something else as well we didn't talk about, and it will be the subject matter of another round table. The digital world participates also in the short-term priority. We take decisions straight away. We want satisfaction and pleasure straight away. When we want something, we want to have it right now. And we can. And when we have service and poor service, we have this, the answer straight away. And we don't have a motivation to have long-term views, to think, to read, and that requires to, uh, to log off from the digital world. And this is more and more difficult. So the long-term priority, which is so essential, no, comp no society can be built without a long-term vision. And it will be adversely affected by the digital world. Thank you. I would like to add something to this. We'll try to have some room for a Q&A session. Yes, but very quickly, I would like to add my fear is that the electronic world of today will uh, be yesterday's illiteracy. It's not because you have a computer or an iPad that you know what the digital world is all about. Not only you don't know uh, the dangers about that's uh, surround it, but if you are a 70-year-old person and you need to fill your uh, tax disclosure form or have a birth certificate, it will be asked from you to surf on the internet and you don't know how to manage this, then we uh, will be far from society's inclusion and then we'll have dishumanization. I would have liked to have an enhanced world because this is what happens with the artificial intelligence. I had the company which created its own uh, chat GPTCA and that saves a lot of time for the consultants because instead of looking into 800 documents and have we talked about that and that type of case law, we know already uh, everything at once. But today, can we consider that everyone has the necessary means to exploit the best of the uh, digital world? Well, the answer is no, and we are creating a, a world where only the happy few will benefit from it, and these happy few will have a better culture, better health, and access to everything, and some others will be underprivileged and will be excluded from everything. Jacques Attili and, and uh, Mrs. Moreno are waiting for your questions now. Yes, you seem to have the same analysis, so it's not really a controversy. It's not a, a problem, actually, on the contrary, but technological progress has uh, pros and cons. It can be the best and the worst. But isn't there an emergency to regulate it? And the question is, how should we do it? You don't have a lot of time left. Yes, you're right. Everything goes via regulation. It will be more and more necessary and more and more difficult. We know what we should do for artificial intelligence. There's a charter that was written down, drafted by UNESCO, by the OECD, by the European Union. There's a wonderful charter that was drafted by the Japanese government. We do know what we have to do, and we have known for quite some time. A lot of charters have been drafted. There was this Isaac Asimov also who, who drafted a charter as well. We know what to do, but we won't do it, obviously. I would like to add as a follow-up, and unfortunately, I agree with him. We have all the necessary means to regulate, but we need to have a lot of political courage. And today, it's not simple. We've seen a lot of laws that try to emerge, and unfortunately, they were uh, killed straight away. And a lot of politicians are using this momentum. There's the law against the protection. There's a data uh, uh, privacy protection law. But we are in a society of production and consumption, and those who have the economic power try to kill these regulations. And I will wrap up with this uh, last point. 
business leaders, uh, those who create platforms, if they do not take into account their own responsibility and are not made accountable, then we will be a in a dead end. Thank you. Thank you, Elisabeth Moreno and Jacques Attali. I would like to recall the title of your book. It's published with Flammarion. You have an autograph session at the FNAC, and we'll see you tomorrow at 8.30. Can we think long term? We will also have a youth-focused uh, uh, session with you, Elisabeth Moreno. Thank you.
Bonjour à tous et bienvenue. Merci. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, session number 30, which is going to take place for about 55 minutes on a theme which is at the heart of uh, the uh, news at the moment. What is the role of companies in society? My name is Emmanuel Kessler. I am uh, editorial director of Prisma Media and the monthly magazine Capital and also management. And these press titles are very much uh, in interaction with companies and society. If we look at recent uh, developments, when a uh, parliamentary assembly recently proposed uh, banning Twitter and the biggest uh, French company was prevented from being the sponsor of the, uh, the 2024 Olympic Games and NGOs and a major French bank are in legal litigation about the financing of fossil fuels. We can see that the interaction between companies and society is becoming stronger and stronger and more and more conf uh, characterized by conflict. Where does the role of company stop? Uh, in addition to producing goods and services, which is their main uh, individual purpose, we're going to talk about this with our guest. We have Ariel Mendes, who's a member of the uh, Circular Dis Economist, who's coordinating the debate, the vice president delegate of uh, law and uh, economy at the Ex-Marseille University. We have Brice Rocher, president of the Rocher Group. We have uh, Manuel Malekas Doublé, CEO of the PMU. Julien Carmona, who is the chairman of Credit Mutual Arkea. Johannes Hout, partner and chairman of the uh, investment fund KKR for East, uh, Middle East, uh, Europe and uh, Africa. And Robert Zarda, economist and CEO of Bonafide. We don't have much time. So, of course, you can ask your questions in the audience, uh, either directly in the room. Don't hesitate to raise your hand. And also online, because I have a little tablet here which enables me to receive the questions from people who are following us uh, remotely. So, thank you, uh, Ariel. Uh, first of all, for uh, as is tradition, for opening up this first session and giving us an introduction to say what are the issues uh, relating to this debate about the role of uh, companies in society so that this uh, discussion is useful and can add to the general uh, running of the uh, rencontre. As has just been said, the question of the roles of companies in society is very much in the news at the moment. It's also a debate that has been taking place throughout the 20th century and uh, exacerbates uh, uh, the situation of risk and uh, cl uh, crises, uh, whether it's in the climate and political or environmental. We know that uh, companies are at the heart of uh, satisfying our needs. If I look at the definition by INSEE, the main purpose of companies is to produce goods and services for the market. So, in fact, in reality, the companies have a social purpose, which is very important but which is always associated with creating economic value because the exchanges are usually monetarized. This objective of creating an economic value is that, uh, therefore, their main end purpose. Historically in France, this debate was decided upon. The role given to companies was indeed to create economic value for their partners, and this economic role was very quickly included in the civil code. Article 1034, and this economic uh, role was inscribed in the, the Civil Code on a, on a permanent basis. In the academic sphere, the main purpose of companies was not really called into question throughout the 20th century until the 1980s, although the concept of social responsibility of enterprises, CSR, began in, to be measured in the 1950s with N.R. Bowen, and uh, if you remember, for some of you, in the 1970s, Milton Friedman stated that the only responsibility of a company was to maximize its profits in order to create a value for shareholders. At the same time, a little later, the theory of uh, stakeholders popularized by Robert Friedman supported a different view, orienting towards the uh, creation of partnership of value. In this vision, company is responsible for all of its stakeholders not only its, actual, its uh, shareholders. If we uh, look at this uh, theory of uh, stakeholders, uh, companies are now not only an economic role, but also a social and environmental role. Without a legal constellation, we know that the social responsibility is a, uh, an optional uh, 
possibility. That uh, depends on the uh, goodwill of the companies. I'm not a specialist in law, so I'm not familiar with international law in this area. But in any case, in France, the Pact Law of uh, 19, 2019 represents uh, an important step forward by modifying Article 1034 of the Civil Code. It requires each company to be managed in its uh, own interest, of course, but also taking account of social and environmental aspects of its activity. This uh, pact plan, Plan for Action of Growth and Transformation of Enterprises, uh, gives a broader definition of the purpose of companies. So they have uh, three roles, economic, social, and environmental role, instead of just a, an economic role. And these correspond in relate to the increasing expectations of society, employees and consumers and uh, suppliers looking for more meaning in their work. And uh, so a major step was forward was taken. The, uh, this is defined in the legal framework. This raises new questions about how these roles are implemented in concrete terms in their organizations. And this raises a lot of questions. I won't list all of them. I'll just mention the main ones. Do these, are these different roles, are they, can they be reconciled, and if so, how? Using which business model can they be supported? Can, do we need to invent a new value proposals, new ways of making profits, and new operational models? And in particular, what are the governance and management principles are required? Do all the companies have the same capacity to uh, combine all of these? And if we answer no, the question is how do we support the companies in their transformation? All of these questions are important because the confirmation of the pact law did not guarantee the effective execution in the changing of the role of the enterprises. And uh, the uh, mission-based uh, companies are a good example of this. The com mission-based companies were at the beginning of 2023, with about more than a thousand of these in France. Most of these mission-based companies are quite young. More than 70% were created after 2010. 80% have less than 50 employees. This means they have a big need for support. And even for larger companies, for example, Danone, which is a victim of uh, speculative funds, they need uh, protection and support. These uh, mission-based companies uh, need uh, to perhaps rethink their means of uh, governance and regulation. I've almost finished this uh, introduction. I'd just like to cover a provocative question asked by a sociologist, Yves-Marie Braga. Are companies necessary? This is an interesting question. Today, in a socio-economic system as it functions, the answer, of course, is yes. As I said in my introduction, companies create boots and uh, services that we cry and have a social purpose in our societies. They are a major player in our economic system. They have to be a major economic player, also in, in the social and ecological transition as well. And there, the role of the public authorities is to help them uh, be engaged in these roles using all of their creative power. And I'll over now to our guests to see how or they use all of their creative power to play the different roles that they have been assigned. Thank you, Ariel, for opening up the prospects. And uh, we'll now continue. I take two points from what you've said, which may be interesting for you, Brice Rocher, the president, the chairman of the Rocher Group since the month of June. You left the management uh, team that where you had been working for 14 years in this family-run company founded by your grandfather. Today is a much more international group than 15 years ago, a leader in cosmetics and uh, plant-based uh, cosmetics. And uh, you were the first international group to adopt this status of a mission-based company. You also author of a report that was handed to the government just before the law was adopted. So in fact, uh, Ariel Mendez told us that uh, sometimes there was a gap between the principle of uh, mission-based engagements and CSR and the reality and the effectiveness. And a lot of people are skeptical about this. And Ariel, you said something which is also important, which is that the state helps companies to fulfill their societal role above and beyond their production capacities. Should we help them or should we force them to play other roles? To answer this question, isn't uh, societal engagement something that can be seen as a bit of something that's a bit of a cosmetic? 
if you don't mind that uh, little joke, Yves Rocher, about Yves Rocher. I have some convictions, but it's not even a conviction, it's just uh, an established fact. A uh, company only functions through its uh, financial capital and human capital. The human capital is uh, innovative production, the culture of values. And without that, because at the end of the day, a uh, company is a collective group of people, men and women, and talents, which is always a good thing as well. The company is there to make, produce products and services for customers, well, not only. It also contributes to creating a collective uh, enterprise and with a specific collective approach. And the status of our mission-based company, I'd like to say that for the first time in its history, the internal corporate culture now has its legal uh, backup. That's interesting in itself because it means we can develop this human capital further. And if you just look at the financial capital only, you won't go very far in, from my point of view. So for me, yes, there's always a risk of uh, purpose washing. Maybe that might just seem to be cosmetic, except that this status does have a number of safeguards. And this makes it legitimate from my point of view. The first safeguard is that you have a mission committee, which is there to produce a report on the uh, realization of the objectives the company has set itself in with, uh, in terms of its mission. The, in other words, the uh, areas in which it's decided to take action. And all of this is certified by a third party independent entity, a, a body which will certify or not, or with the reservations, to determining whether or not the company has achieved the objectives it set itself in relation to its missions and its uh, uh, struggle. From what I've seen, for me, the Rocher Group since 1959 has been involved in this kind of work. It's not been becoming a purpose-based emission uh, company in uh, more recently that we suddenly started to take this approach. The, ever since the beginning of the company, we have taken this approach. Ever since the experience my grandfather had in the beginning, it's a struggle in favor of nature. And the point is to reconnect people to nature. By adopting this uh, purpose-based uh, company, we have made explicit something which was too implicit internally. And uh, this is in relation to the employees, the men and women we employ. This has a specific, very powerful virtue, and uh, which we were able to measure through the daily commitment and the pride of belonging of uh, the employees to the company. And so this is essential because uh, we carry out Pelos surveys. I can tell you that at the worst time of the COVID crisis, where we had to reorganize, we didn't all experience this COVID crisis in the same way with the various lockdowns that we had to go through. Not everybody had their holiday home that they could go to in the countryside. I was convinced of one thing at that time, which was that the commitment of the men and women working for us internally, I was sure that their commitment was going to go down compared to before the COVID crisis. In fact, it's much greater now. I don't mean by that that the specific status as a mission-based company has helped to do that. But I think it has helped. This makes it explicit something which is too implicit from me, my point of view. I think this is essential. What do we make explicit? It's the reason for being of the company. Just hand over to the other speakers. And to conclude on this point, if the reason for a company to exist is honey, the mission-based company is royal jelly. What is the reason for being overwashing to reconnect uh, people to nature? Why is that? In fact, my grandfather always had a lot of health problems, quite serious health problems. And so, in fact, when he was very young, his parents had to give him homeschooling. He couldn't go to school. And so it made him very close to his father, except that when he was 14, his father died. This was in 1944 in a small village in Brittany. And uh, this terrible family event caused him to go and live in the forest for two years. He wasn't living in the woods all the time, he didn't sleep in the woods all the time, but he was in very close contact with nature. This enabled, was enabled to him to be con, uh, soothed and, uh, had, and enabled him to see that nature has a positive impact on our, us as human beings and saw that nature had a positive impact when he created the company 10 years later. He sh sought to reconcile economic performance and a kind of societal commitment, in other words, the struggle to protect nature. 
economic performance, why was that? Because of, he didn't have any finance himself, so he had to work hard for it from the very beginning. And also, this struggle to defend nature was because of the experience he had uh, living in, in the woods for two years. So this is due, therefore, to the personal experience that my grandfather had when he was 14 years old. And this constantly enriched his uh, professional career, and we're trying to sustain this now through uh, our family today. Thank you, Brice Rocher. We'll come back with you to talk about the challenge this represents and the difficulties and the tensions that can exist for um, a company that makes uh, cosmetics and also has industrial processes to uh, comply with and uh, in the manufacturing process. I'll now hand over to Emmanuel Malcaz Doublé. You, uh, for one, the last year, you have been the young CEO of the PMU, which is the uh, Parimutuel Urbain. You've been working for them since 2018. PMU is an economic interest grouping. It's the leading horse racing betting company in the world. In France, you have a monopoly on uh, horse racing, but not uh, horse racing betting, but not online. You have 75% of your income is from bets, and also you have uh, other sources of income. You don't have a status uh, as a mission-based company, as uh, Yves Bis Rocher has defined it in the pact law, which he has looked at and which he has adopted himself. Does this mean that, in fact, without having the legal char characteristics, that you also are a mission-based company? I'd like to start by saying that as the CEO of the PMU, I'm also often astonished that I'm asked a lot of questions about the figures and the performance of the company, but not very much about the purpose of our company. And yet I would say that by definition, we are a mission-based company. Why did I say that by definition? Because the 800 million euros is our income, and these 8 million euros are completely, this is a profit, and so this is distributed to the uh, uh, horse racing industry. This is, uh, if you don't have any PM, you won't have any horses left in France. So we, all of the money is invested back into the horse racing industry. Another mission which is uh, important to me is uh, social bonds. PMU represents uh, conviviality, 14,000 bars and uh, restaurants that have a, the PMU system in the, in the bar. Everywhere in France you have a, uh, a bar using a PMU system. More, we have more uh, outlets than the post offices are in France. So this is particularly the case in small village and in rural areas where we play an important role and uh, we provide a physical uh, source of social bonds. So concerning the role of our company, my conviction is the role of the company is to promote trust. Why do I say that? Because for the last four or five years we've been talking about the meaning of companies. Of course, you have to have a meaning to what you do. With the new generations, you will never be able to recruit if you don't have some sort of meaning, if you don't give a meaning to your activity. I'd like to say that's maps uh, now old hat because what's happening now is our citizens want to have trust. You have to show that you are sincere, that you're authentic in what you do. And uh, trust isn't an easy thing to, uh, to obtain from people. You have to get people to trust you the customers, your employees, and also all of the horse racing sector. It's not easy to do because this is a society of mistrust. People are always afraid there's a lot of mission washing, as we talk about greenwashing, yes. That's why I'm emphasizing that point. I'd like to give you a recent example. It's the most uh, joyful example, but uh, there have been riots recently. You must have seen this. We have 250 outlets which completely uh, vandalized. When I say vandalized, I don't mean the windows were broken. I mean people went in and broke absolutely everything, burned everything. There's no, the outlet has been destroyed. 250 out of the 14,000 is quite a lot. So what we've done, we have the Confederation of Tobacconists and other people involved in our activity. Very quickly went into the field. We had 200 people who uh, were assigned to go into the field to answer the telephone calls and to provide help in these uh, outlets. And we took action more quickly than the state. I'm not saying the state shouldn't take action, of course, on the contrary. In fact, the minister, Gabriel Attal, is preparing a plan to help these tobacconists, which will be communicated in the next few days. The agility of our company means that very quickly, in less than 48 hours, we were able to mobilize our people. We were able, of course, on the scale of the PMU, as we have a, 
800,000, 800 million uh, profit uh, every year. We're able to, to use our resources to provide this assistance very quickly. Just an example to show that the company can act more in a more agile way than the state and can be a source of trust. And we'll be, this is how we were able to reestablish our trust by being close to our partners, by showing that we were there to help them and we were showing them to, uh, they could trust us and have confidence in us confidence in us so we were helping them and the rest of the year they are running the activity and giving us something in return so it's sort of like an after, a customer service uh, action on our part to provide this uh, support i think it's a, a big move that has to be made to instill confidence and trust and this is very important for our citizens in the area of betting there's a big issue with addiction and fraud as well online it's rather paradoxical to give yourself a, a virtuous mission when you're often on the on the can tilt over to the other side. I don't think we're on the we really tilting over to the other side. The PMA can only be sustainable if we're responsible. We have people working on this. You talked about the online casinos. There you can any of you can look in the room if you type a online casino, you can bet, and it's completely illegal activity. Online casinos are illegal in France. It's, they are not taxed, there's no prevention of excessive gambling, and we have a role to play to here again, uh, support people and how, see how we can regulate this activity. The activity it exists, it represents 1 billion uh, euros of turnover at the moment. There's a lot of work to do to protect our citizens uh, by being more responsible and also helping the government to regulate an activity which at the moment is completely illegal and is out of control. And on the last point that you mentioned about excessive gambling at the PMU, we have 20 people working specifically on this theme. We use big data to anticipate uh, problems with people gambling excessively and we can uh, close down people's accounts if necessary. We're very, uh, it's very important to us to look after people. Professor Red, uh, no, Julia Kamana, sorry, you're chairman of the Cadet Mutual Are you based in Brest? You also work in the Nivellacetan region. Strong growth over the last few years, 11,000 employees, including 7,000 in Brittany. You've become a mission based company in 2022, and you say that uh, giving the nine put financial performance of you give the same importance as a financial results. This is what you said to me beforehand. It's rather surprising coming from a banking institution. So for you, the non-financial results are just as important as financial results? I find that difficult to believe. Well, I'll try to convince you that this is the case and explain it to you. Perhaps I can go back to what you said. You said we were a cooperative bank, a regional cooperative bank. So let's come back to the status. We, we, we are a cooperative a mutualist bank. What does this mean? It means we don't have any shareholders. The shareholders are our customers, who we call the members. Then it's a democratic organization, one vo vote for each person. So the whole governance of the group is the result of the actions by the customers and by the society at the local level. We have a credit mutual at Arkia. We have uh, 300 uh, local uh, outlets in small villages and towns. At the credit mutual overall, this represents 2,000. We have a local uh, bank. You have uh, your bank advisors and you have uh, uh, board of directors who represents the local company. So in mine, there will be a nurse, a company director, a retired engineer, a teacher, give a kind of uh, like a slice of society. And in this context, where it's really the elected representatives who determine the activity uh, and actions of our group, the question of what our role is in society, in fact, it speaks for itself. And in fact, it's to enable to be beneficial for society. I'll come back to the uh, question of uh, profit and uh, non-financial uh, uh, criteria. The only way we can grow, we have grown a great deal, they've been around for more than 100 years. The only way is to put the income in back into uh, company. We reinvest it back. There are no dividend. And this enables us to continue growing. So this, give, this is beneficial to the local companies, uh, what we call the stakeholders. I'd like to talk about social, environmental, and territorial responsibility. These are our three aspects that we work on. In this area, I think the, 
this uh, mission-based status is, uh, helps us, although it's not a guarantee of virtue. This uh, pact law of uh, creating mission-based companies, uh, you've, Bruce Roche was a pioneer. We joined this, became, joined, started getting this status last year. This uh, means we have a, a different model, especially for our younger employees who wanted to have a meaning for what they were doing. It's not as simple as that in practice. It's as Ariel Mendes was saying, you can have uh, objectives that are very good in themselves that are contradictory. This management of contradictions is the essence of a mission-based company and also the problem for companies today. Imagine that in Brittany you finance agriculture a great deal, which doesn't always risk protect the environment. Yes, absolutely, it can be an abattoir in uh, Brittany, which is in the only employer in the local area, and they create jobs which wouldn't exist otherwise, and they pollute the water and uh, they re generate emissions as well. I'd like to thank you for that question. So to deal with that, we have an accounting, accounting tool, which is unique today, which consists in measuring the externalities of everything we do ourselves and everything that our customers do when we finance them. So to put it simply, the development of our customers makes it possible to create jobs which wouldn't exist without us. We reason in the differential way. There's a this means we play a part in, in, in producing these jobs when our activity and our customers' activities means that we, there is an emission of a lot of CO2, and we all know that can become uh, unacceptable. There's also a contribution to the uh, emission of CO2, which will also be included in the non-financial results. It doesn't solve everything, but it's a way of uh, defining the subject. And so we have the financial results, and the non-financial results we can be positive or negative, and I'd like to end we were saying that our natural original species is 600 and 800 million, and the impact of our balance sheet is 9 billion in social, environmental, and territorial impact, and more than 1 billion of destruction of environmental value. How do we do that? How do we do balance those out? It's at least a one way of talking about the subject of the contradictions. Perhaps uh, I could say that despite your good intentions, the the way you talk about uh, the mutualist uh, society is not uh, always a world of Teletubbies either. Yes, it's true that uh, in our case we have asserted our vision and we have reconciled the differences and uh, we have uh, settled this with the rest of the Curie Mutual. I would say it's a world of consensus. Thank you very much, uh, Julien Carmona. Of course, uh, you'll be able to answer some questions in a little while. Johannes Suter, you are partner and chairman of the uh, KKR investment fund for the uh, Middle East, uh, Europe and Africa. You're one of the biggest players in investment in the world, very much present in the European market, very much present also for more than 20 years since 20, 2002 in France in private equity, infrastructures and real estate and new technologies, about 40 uh, companies in your portfolio. So Elsan, the biggest private hospital company, April, uh, insurance broker, Nika as well. Your colleague was saying just now that maybe it's easier to be a mission-based company. We don't have shareholders. When the shareholders are play an important role and they decide what's going to happen and they invest, can you define societal objectives for well-being and environmental and social protection? Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Come on, uh, Thank you. I will speak in English. I will answer in French to your questions, but there's simultaneous interpreting for those who wish to have it. So if I may start. All uh, uh, Virage to address this question that was asked about do we still need a company? Do we still need this legal form of a firm? So what I've done is uh, let's go back to economic theory. We are in the uh, uh, Rencontre Economique. Uh, and economic theory on this comes from 1937 from Roland Coase, who won a Nobel Prize for his work in this area. And basically what he says is the reason companies exist is that they basically provide lower transaction costs between individuals than a loose association of individuals. So there's an economic reason for a firm to exist, which I don't think has gone away over the last uh, 75 years since Roland Coase wrote his paper. So starting with that, that there is an economic reason, I come back to the question that you've asked is, what do we look for in the companies that we invest in? And are ESG or social criteria part of what we're looking for? And the answer is absolutely they are. 
but the key is why is that the case? And I think that's, for me, the absolute uh, uh, critical point. And the reason is that it's good business for us, for these things to be part of the objectives of the companies that we invest in. Let me give you a few examples. And I start with a G in ESG, governance. In all of our companies, we insist that the boards of management are diverse so that we have a good participation of different gender and different perspective in the boards. Why is that the case? The case is because it has been proven in many, many studies that diverse teams perform better than non-diverse teams. So it's good business for us to do this. Then let's talk about the environment. Every one of our companies, we insist, measures their carbon footprint. And we also ask them to show us a plan as to how they can improve that carbon footprint over the next five years. And we put in management's objectives that they uh, will be measured on how they perform against this plan. Again, why are we doing this? We're doing this because it's good for the companies and it makes them better businesses. So, in, in effectively, I think that driver, the driver of good business is what makes us do this. And I think we will continue to do this. We're in the leading front. Now, of course, this has changed over the past decade. And the reason it's changed is that the regulatory and societal environment has changed and made this decisions better business than maybe that was some time ago. So I think there is an interplay between the company society and the regulatory authorities which drives this behavior to being more front-footed on these ESG criteria. Thank you. Merci, Johannes. Robert Zarader. Thank you, Johannes. You're from a consultancy firm, Bonafide. You're a strategy consultant. How do you analyze all that has been said earlier on. We have a lot of uh, good intentions from companies. There's a strong will to become full-fledged actors of their own businesses, but also of the society at large. Is it reasonable, ultimately? You don't have any mic. Yeah. All right. So normally, you each have a mic. That's what I was told. Does it work? Hello? Thank you for the invitation. Well, the school year has ended, so I will not uh, abide by any instructions. And uh, I will be, I will play this mischievous guy. We have given a name to companies. They had a limited responsibility, and they should be also joint stock companies. And I'm referring back to an Eddie Mitchell song talking about the Société Anonyme, the joint stock company, or a private limited company. And this uh, refers me back to the front page of uh, the Provence newspaper when we talk about uh, Milan Farmer's song, Désenchanté, which means disenchanted with this world. And that echoes, and we should acknowledge what is happening now and which is very important. This Everything is built in-house, and the mission purpose uh, the mission-focused uh, companies is important in-house. Being mischievous, I could s talk about a certain uh, ways in being uh, in playing that game and in having uh, mis mission-focused companies. So, being useful to the society, making the world progress. I'm not going to play this game. And nature also reconnect men to nature yes but I don't I don't want to tackle all the subjects the first point is that the nature of the company is old already in the 60s that was an issue uh, that is at a time when the, those that under 20 uh, the, the, the young people shape that kind of corporate world and it's quite interesting the relationship with the corporate world was shaped at the time, and it um, is in line with what we're talking right now, namely as a financial and societal stakeholder. But there's a resistance to this private sphere. And I would like to say something, because when we talk about mission-driven companies, sustainable development, responsible companies, we take note of something that is already in existence, and for any 
a job applicant, it is actually the minimum that is required. That's the minimum that we could accept. We have uh, enacted a lot of laws on that point. We have given, uh, we have fleshed out a legislative um, content for this, but this is secondary in my opinion. Beyond the ecosystem of the company, a survey has been carried out recently. Uh, 25% can say what is a purpose driven and 10% can talk about a raison d'etre. The figures are quite low, but it has an immediate uh, interest for uh, the in-house ecosystem of the company. As for the rest, we feel that it's only a hypocrisy. We talk about responsible companies, CSR driven companies, and so on and so forth. But what is really important, what seems really important for me, it's not how companies adjust and are included in the company in the society, but how they will resist to the society trends. I will give you a few instances. And uh, that's uh, part and parcel of the wokeism trend. And I will talk about how the US influence uh, France. When the Disney boss in Florida, criticizes DeSantis on the prohibition of having sexual education lessons in uh, Florida. They go from the fifth favorite company to the 77th uh, uh, favorite company when Bud Light, for instance, the beer producing company chooses as a an influencer, as an ambassador, an influencer who's uh, defending LGBT rights they lose $5 billion of a stock value, of stock exchange value. When you have a big American distributor that decides to have the uh, Pride Month after eight months and after a lot of attacks from the social medias, they need to, draw, to, to, to go backwards. So there's a real subject as to resistance vis-a-vis -vis the society to vis-a-vis -vis society phenomena. Why? Because society has evolved with three elements that are really crucial. The first of which is the feeling that we are con totally disconnected from the world. It is not the case when we are in a company, but at the macro level, we are totally disconnected. And it plays also a role inside the corporate world. And then there are two important movements, polarization, radicalization. And these movements are influencing the corporate world. I'm going to talk about something which is quite surprising. In a large French company, a boss will, will take decisions as to the business unit and present it herself or in front of the salaried employees. And after the presentation, after first contact with the managers, they would preside that she's lesbian. Very sincerely, nowadays, all these subjects are of concern to me. Why? Because we see now that there's a strong porosity in these society phenomena. We can have different opinions. I'm not judgmental here. But I'm taking stock of the situation. We're lagging behind. We're regulating the environmental aspects, the climate change driven aspects. And it's all good. But afterwards, be careful with the next wave, with the next tsunami, which has sped up with uh, homeworking. Homeworking has entailed a permeability of the private sphere within the corporate world. And the corporate world will have to. Uh, bear with that. And I'm going to talk about a trend that is quite interesting, another phenomenon, namely religious practice inside the corporate world, inside the, the corporate walls. There has been a report that is being fine-tuned on this subject. In 90% of the cases, there's no problem. In a normal framework, within discussions with your line managers, you can manage the way in which uh, religious practices are accepted in the corporate world. But for 20% of cases, especially for SMEs, it is dramatic. Why? Because this creates controversies, community gaps, and divides, and it's difficult to manage for uh, business managers. And I would like to say a last word. I'm not a credit mutual agent, but 
What is interesting in what Credit Mutuel has done and uh, seldom to find is that the boss imposed a rule of 120. They cannot earn 20 times more than the minimum salary. Do you agree with that rule? With this 120 ratio, do you like it? I know this rule very well, and in a lot of uh, my companies, we actually apply this rule. Good. Okay. Does someone want to react to what has just been said? Because the debate has been completely reversed as to the emission of society within the company. That's the woke capitalism. They have remarked a phenomenon that has been translated into the fact that the Silicon Valley Vong had a chief diversity officer, but not a chief risk officer. So are we drifting away from what should be done? Can we stop it? Well, before you can actually speak about this, well, honestly, if the Silicon Valley Bank had the such problem, it's not because they were not woke. It's because in the banking world, they just lacked the right competences. They did not have the right skills. Well, our society is a small society. Is it good? Is it no good? Well, that's the way it is. Permeability exists. We have to manage it. It is true with these uh, financial objective issues, but other surrounding issues, the society has become an agora. We discuss about everything. Maybe it's something good because we're preparing ourselves to these new subjects coming up. When we say, OK, we're about to stop uh, to finance it if we can't stop these trends. But for the guy living in the proximity and the one living 100 kilometers away, they do not have the same point of view. There's a company, there's a society within the company, and points of view are different. But it's also interesting to have different points of view. And the aim is to survive altogether. So if we do not do all of this, we will be considered as non-relevant, unbearable, and we will disappear altogether. We need to survive. And that means that we need to open up to this new pressure, to this new permeability with the society at large. Would, would someone like to raise their hands and ask a question? Yes. Please introduce yourself beforehand. Please stand up. We have 10 minutes left. So the questions need to be short. Um, I come from the youth delegation and the community of the Green uh, Rising Stars. I'm part of the uh, youth delegation. How do you create trust for the young people? And how do you allow them to uh, feel good in the company and to feel trustful for this, uh, in these environmental ob objectives? How do they? How do they feel about this? I will uh, answer to that question because uh, that's an important issue at stake for my company. It's not a problem. We talk about youth. I started when I was uh, 34 years old. I took over the management when I was 34 years old. If we're performance, if we inspire trust, if we have a vision for the long term for the company, it's not a criterion. In my own company, I always try to uh, instill that uh, uh, vision. It never was a problem for me. And within PMU, those who are promoted are those who deserve it, no, notwithstanding the gender or the age, because that was also a, a, a matter. When I, uh, I had a seat at the board of directors, I was the only woman. And this is what I'm trying to push forward in terms of uh, topics. We have to start by our own company when we want to promote values within the society at large. May it be for youth-related uh, topics or for gender equality topics. Thank you. Another question in the back. And then there's a lady as well. Louise, I'm a member of uh, the Green Budding Stars uh, generation. You're very proactive in your approach, in your business models within the uh, legal framework of mission-focused uh, company. We, it is very perfectible, and it's not compulsory for SMEs under 50 employees. So I wonder, are we going to lose this quality? Are we going to withdraw it from the legal articles of our association if uh, uh, we do not uh, uh, show that we are good enough when there's an audit? What do you think about this? Well. 
the status as uh, and the bi corp and the b corp status are complementary when we the it's the raison d'etre of the company and it means have putting up a fight sacrificing other things obviously but that means committing the company within a, a fight uh, for the benefit of the employees not doing it in a way that would be that would mean foregoing um, economic profitability because at the end of the day, what, it, what is important is not figures. It's the, the ladies and gentlemen that work within the company. They need to work together. They need to feel good when they work within this company. And this is where you have an added value. The B Corp status, well, it's to be in compliance with a lot of issues, may it be in terms of governance, environment, uh, CSR, and so on. It's more of a certificate. It's, 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 it's a label certificate. As for us, it's nature. But when we say this, we could be lagging behind on diversity, equality, and so on. But having this B Corp status, we, we, our uh, turnover is t is falls into the scope of B Corp's, uh, B Corp status. And that actually plays the role of a watchdog. And investing as soon as today will serve a purpose outside this legal framework that will be to the benefit of the company because anyway the law will impose it on us at one at a given moment a time so let's anticipate things it will be less painful for the company afterwards rather than waiting for the um, uh, bill of law to be enacted and to be imposed upon us hello my name is dina forneret i'll speak slowly Because I'm a physic, I had a stroke and I lost my tongue. And this explains why I'm speaking slowly. I was, re uh, uh, I was told that it would be better for me to come and I'm delighted to, to have come. Because renewing hope is our job every day, every morning when we wake up. Making choices is essential because it's the same. We need to move forward. We need to be proactive and forward-looking and constructive in our approach. I'm not going to dwell too much on my question, but we have to manage to listen to one another, especially with people that have the same problem as I do, or anyone that has had a stroke because the brain has uh, uh, split, been split open and we're not the same person overnight. Everything that you have explained for the society, well, it's different from us because our life on a daily basis, well, life at work is, any, is, is what is essential for us because if we don't have a um, life at work, we have no life at all. And this is our logic. I don't know how to phrase my, sent my question as I should, but please listen to this idea. And please come and see me afterwards to defend a phasic impulse that I'm trying to trigger to try to find a bridge between the rencontre économique and entrepreneurs and to come in Ramatuel and in Saint-Tropez and, and to work with the aphasic people and crew members to talk together and build bridges. To, so, we have two minutes left, but there was a question online. We should have those that are working for uh, the world to do so, do you see another path rather than taxing the less virtuous companies? This is quite interesting. Should we tax those that are less virtu virtuous, that are less proactive? Well, that's a, that's a perspective, that's an opinion. We could consider this. It's a way of making uh, things progress. It's not the only one, but that's one possibility. Amongst the different considerations that we mention, there's one thing we never mentioned, 
as the economist would say, and I was an economist, if we have to talk about uh, the external adversely uh, affecting um, considerations. We can talk about training, health, and this matter is very important. Indeed, this would, this, this would require, because this is being done in other fields, for non-virtuous companies and those that contribute to that and that type of uh, uh, climate change, we could consider taxing them. But in the first debate that we had this morning, Mr. Pouyane must be in total disagreement with me. That is the debate. That is the controversy. We'll stop here. In, in a nutshell, in 20 seconds, as for woke companies, we ended up forgetting that uh, companies are part and parcel of the society. And we should talk about it with uh, economic anthropologists. Thank you for this conclusion. Thank you to all of you for having participated in this debate. We continue. And this, the day is not over.
Bonsoir à tous. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being here. You're, there are a lot of you in the room despite the heat, so uh, well done. Things will go better as the evening goes along. Yes, we've got a very tricky job ahead of us. We've got to make the world desirable. To do this, we've got a wonderful panel to address all of the questions you're wondering about. So we have got Estelle Brachenlof from Veolia, Jean-Pierre Clamadieu from NG. We've got Eric Lombard. Direct General Manager of uh, Caisse des Dépôts, and Florent Ménégeux from Michelin. And we've got the Mayor of Florence with us, Dario Nardella. So welcome to everybody. Our coordinator is Yann Algon, and I'm going to hand the floor to him immediately to introduce this uh, round table on the desirability of our future. Off you go, Yann. Hello. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We really are delighted to see so many of you here and so delighted to have this prestigious panel with us to talk about making our world more desirable. I would allow myself to um, quote Daniel Cohen, who wrote a book called The World is Closed. Uh, but desire infinite, infinite. Well, that's the translation of the French title, anyway. So, economic growth was is the religion of the modern world. Does that soothe um, conflicts? The promise is indefinite, and the promises of dramas every day is to wish what we do not have. In other words, growth was the solution to uh, the anthropological state of the world, and desire was infinite. So having set the stage, how can we reconcile our infinite desires in a closed world, in a world where there is no planet B, and in a world where the most important thing is to protect living life, biodiversity, and our planet? And above all, how can we implement all of the different policies, including all of the different players? We've got businesses, we've got public policy, we've got state and citizens, and we are very fortunate to have the most eminent people of those three groups, businesses, civil society, and public policy, at this round table. So we will wonder whether uh, technological progress is enough to combine economic growth and uh, protecting life and the, there are many businesses uh, which are hoping to have a net carbon trajectory by 2050. Is that enough? What is going to be the role of the state in terms of funding, as we saw with uh, a different, uh, uh, different reports which have shown that the path ahead is very steep? And what is the role of citizens? Should each and every one of us curb our desires? Should we become frugal? And how can we do this in a context where there is strong demand for purchasing power and public services and uh, very strong social stress and tension? So our panel is going to talk, is going to answer all of these questions, providing all of the solutions. Well, thank you very much for having uh, described what's at stake here. Yes, you've reminded us that capitalism is the driver and that is a uh, subject of desire. There's been a, a, an accumulation. So how do we deal with this driver? I don't know if we can replace it with something else. There are many constraints which are growing in strength, such as carbon emissions. And who defines what? these new constraints are, what the new rules are. Do we move towards a decarbonated growth? Who's going to tell us? Who's going to fix these uh, new rules? And to invest all of this money that we've been talking about, well, who's going to pay? Who's going to change the rules of capitalism? We're going to talk about all of this. We're going to start by having uh, dividing our debate into two parts so that all participants can be involved. We're going to give everyone a couple of minutes. And then who fixes the, the rules? Is it the states, communities, businesses? We're talking about decarbonization. Is it the businesses who are leading the field there? For one or two years now, businesses have changed their business models through opportunism, but also perhaps conviction in terms of carbonization, decarbonization. So who, uh, Estelle Bachelanov, do we need to change the rules and who fi fixes those rules? Well, you've talked about eco-anxiety. So when we see that we need to be very simple to, to try and find a, a solution, well, 
I'm convinced that uh, we we, we all have this feeling that there is no solution, so that awareness is here. And every time I see youngsters or those who are less young, they say, so what? What can I do as a simple citizen or as an employee in, in a company and as a voter? And there is a path. There is a pathway. There are many hurdles along the way. It's a combination of things. It's very complicated. You need frugality, you need solutions, innovations in technology. You need all of these things at the same time. We do have uh, solutions to decarbonize and to depollute and to regenerate resources. And so for me, the challenge is how do we manage to bring together that des social desire, political will, and the technological offering and techno that, that exists. How do we combine all of this? Who lays down the law? Well, I think everybody has to roll up their sleeves and get down to that. And rather than just addressing the question of the rules, we should, we should be uh, acting. I think we need to act now with solutions that exist now, and we need to speed up. Are things going fast enough? Or are we in a, uh, in a race against the clock towards decarbonization because the technology exists? Well, we usually say that half of the solutions already exist. The, we have to invent the other half, so we need innovation. There are two ways of seeing things. Either we wait for that second half of the solutions to be ready, which is what some are doing, or we could say we've got half of the solutions already, so we would be better off speeding things up with what we have. And this is on a regional scale. This is the second uh, of my convictions. It's bottom up. It starts off in the regions. It starts with coalitions with, of people with different interests and points of view. Well, uh, Jean-Pierre Clamadieu. Well, yes, I agree with what Estelle concluded about action, but I've got another couple of action of uh, conclusions to put in there. So, of the past recent years, past three years, we've been going through some amazing crises that have taken us all by surprise. There's the health, there's the health crisis. There's that war. There's a lot of destruction in our supply chains, including the energy supply chain. There's a lot of chaos. Businesses have. Uh, reorganize themselves amazingly to cope with all that. I'm really struck by what's happening in France with our clients, our partners, and I think there's an ability to dream up solutions which is just a source of inspiration. Who could have imagined that we could uh, use uh, nine, that 96 percent of our employees would work from home in a matter of hours and change all of that. These are things which we can do and we really have to um, take a look at new challenges, climate change and other urgent issues that are uh, around us. I'm full of hope and trust and confidence in business's ability to provide a whole palette of solutions. Let's not uh, hide behind governments and and all kinds of organizations. No, let's simply shoulder our own responsibility. Yes, we do need a framework, we need goals, and that is the responsibility of politicians nationally, but also increasingly uh, in Europe for subjects that we're talking about today. Yes, I believe that businesses of all sizes have to shoulder their responsibility. They often have the resources, or they can access those uh, resources, governance, technology, flexibility, which will enable them to contribute solutions. So when you see this title of our session, Making the World Desirable, it's kind of a distant, far-off goal, or that's the way I interpret it. But I think that, on the contrary, we need to bring it closer into concrete uh, terms and in everyday action. So what is desirable? It's the fact of coming to work for us, us being a collective uh, term. And when you are fortunate enough to work for NG, a group that is that is exists for the energy transition we can attract talents we can say to them in the future you are going to help us to solve a whole range of problems in big urban uh, conglomerations by inventing new energy systems having new approaches such as with hydrogen and i think it's thanks to this being present in action that we will be able to uh, motivate our colleagues and also perhaps our clients ng has several 
million clients in France. And it's this subject of commitment is so important in my eyes. I think commitment to serving projects uh, and transitions. And I think that must be our joint goal, us business leaders, to show the collective usefulness of the projects that we are deploying and the actions that we carry out. So perhaps rather than making the world desirable, I think it's a question of making sure that here and now, we offer our colleagues and our clients an opportunity to act, to cope with all of the problems that the, the, that the planet is facing. Yeah, many initiatives have been uh, talked about here, but there's one taboo, in fact, and that's money. No one's been talking about money. Who is going to pay? The cost is going to be colossal. Um, one contribution said that six, uh, six, seven billion euros per year for many years. There's a banker, Eric uh, Lombard is with us. He is the, the bank manager of transition. He knows a lot about uh, finance. I know that you have been wondering about the sustainability of the finance for the transition. Do we have the money? Can we keep our model, our capitalistic model running with this uh, return rate as it is today? Well, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I'm representing the Caisse des Depots. And uh, I think the question here of money and funding and financing is not really a question, but as you said in the introduction, who fixes the rules? It will, uh, it will only work if the market economy rules are modified in depth. Let me explain my reasoning behind this. It's very simple. Uh, John Pisani's uh, re report is, I think, the first major report drawn up by some macroeconomists, so very serious professional people. They give us a framework for thought, and they say in the next five years, we have to invest 300 billion euros just in France. So why this sum? Because ecological transformation is necessary not, uh, if the world is to be not only desirable but uh, can survive, and in that way it can remain desirable, it means that we have to change all of the way we operate and produce. Let me give you an example. You may not know, Jean-Pierre Clamédier knows, but renewable energies today are developed mainly by local councils. I was in the Loiret with a regional uh, prefect there, and we were talking about solar panels there. So we are co-shareholders in several regions in France of major companies. And in public transport, all of the uh, regional trains are going to be developed. I'm not going to give you every single example because there are many of them. These investments and these 300 billion that Pisani was talking about in his Result. The funds exist. The question is, are they, uh, is, that, uh, is that money available? Who's going to manage it and who's going to borrow it? So it's an amazing question here. So part of it will go through the local councils. I'm convinced that local councils, at a time when Mar the state has no more room for manoeuvre, the local councils are an option. They can take out debt, and that's why I've mentioned certain regions in France which are working on renewable energies. Mobility, These are, this is of interest to the regions. Social housing, of course, is going to involve local players and heating in uh, apartments, etc. Same thing. So I think uh, state debt is, is a very big question, but we, we've got traditions here. And the rest, as Estelle and Jean-Pierre have mentioned this, is down to businesses. Businesses are going to have to revolutionize their production processes, repatriate factories so that we have low carbon factories in France, and that will require massive funds. And this transition has two consequences. First of all, some of that funding, some of that investment rather, is not going to be very profitable. It's necessary. This morning, we heard from the boss of Solvec who said that she transformed one of her factories and that costed a lot of money but is not giving any return on that investment yet. And so there's a second consequence which is even more important, and that is that ecological transformation is going to cost a lot to individuals and it's going to cost a lot to those people who have very small incomes. They are going to have to do, they're going to have 
insulate their homes, they're going to change their car, they're going to have to change their way of consumption, it's going to cost them more to buy their food. So, there are these, so that this ecological transformation can take place, businesses are going to have to invest in non-profitable um, projects, but we're going to have to help the purchasing power of those people with the smallest revenue. The only way of balancing the system in a market economy, if we want to invest, which is not going to be very profitable, but necessary, and increase employees' uh, purchasing power, is mean that we have to agree to bring down the cost of capital and uh, make sure that our market economy has a smaller profitability rate. I would add, all roundtables have said this. One of the problems that we face today is the increase in the inequality of our different estates and our wealth. There's an uh, inequality of uh, revenue, but however, the inequalities of uh, of our wealth is ex is uh, being uh, reinforced. Well, we'll take a look at that later on. We'll see whether the profitability of capital can be reduced. We'll ask the sh the sh your shareholders for that. Yes, you mentioned Solvay's uh, project. This is something which Veolia carried out for Solvay. We are replacing coal with waste. 70 percent uh, carbon. There is a business model which goes with it. So it's profitable? OK. Florent Minigo. Now, when we were preparing this roundtable together, I was su surprised by your unfailing optimism. You said that uh, you believe in humanity. We've always come through and we will manage once again this time. So for your employees, you're going to offer a collective rave. Well, the question of making the world desirable is like a functional question. However, it depends on what kind what your view is of the world. In reality, in 2023, is the situation worse than it was in 43? In 1943, this situation wasn't particularly rosy. We were all in a worldwide, a world war. We were in a terrible uh, situation. Humanity was in danger. Since then, we've created a lot of wealth. We have uh, brought millions of people out of poverty. We have uh, had some wonderful technological development, which means that we can progress. And here we are at the heart of innovation. Innovation it means saying what's true today is because we have a certain standpoint. And if we were to take a different standpoint, we would see things differently. So the questions which are on the table today are huge challenges, of course. But from my point of view, uh, not well, something. this is something we can do. Michelin feels that this is something we can do. Estelle Jean-Pierre, you said certain things. We can see amazing solutions which are going to come onto the markets in 5, 10, 15 years. And of course, when you take a look at the world today, you wonder, well, without those things, how can you understand that things are going to get better? So the question of uh, financing is a, is a true issue, naturally. And the question of sharing out value and wealth is a true topic for society, and it goes beyond simply France. It is at the very heart of all debates. If we have transition which is only possible for the rich, well, that means there's going to be a huge problem ahead of us. And in the past, we have managed to get people, millions of people out of extreme poverty in the world. Today, 9% of the population is extremely poor, where it was 40% just a few decades ago. So we have made huge progress. Now, of course, there are 5 billion people on the earth who live with less than $5 a day. That is an issue, of course. And behind that, we have to be able to offer not only something which will enable those who live comfortably to consume less energy and to have a smaller impact, but also to enable those who own less wealth to access more wealth. So the question is, how do we uh, pro manage to f uh, reach that goal? Well, innovation generates new regulation, but new regulation generates innovation. So in reality, both go hand in hand together. And depending on which started, when there's innovation coming up, then we need regulation for the innovation to reach the markets, and then regulation uh, triggers among the companies the, an idea and says, how are we going to respond to this? And that generates a, an innovation capacity. And we've seen it when we went through crisis. We endured crisis and that were very deep, very serious. And globally, it was chaotic, but we managed to get out of it and to rise to the challenge. 
And we're stronger now. Well, as to the general pessimism, something that is quite striking is the notion of progress. 60% of people that were uh, questioned thought that uh, progress is negative, that because we think that techno technological progress is negative because it involves more consumption and so on and so forth. But if we were all having Michelin tires, yes. Well, today, to uh, drive kilometers, we consume 1.4 million kilo uh, uh, kilometers a year. But if we were to have uh, Michelin tires, we would need 250 million tires less without changing anything with profit, with more profit and less accidents. So progress is all about this. We need regulation for innovation to have a positive impact and to access the markets. So when we talk about a leveling playing field, this is what we talk about, the rules of the game, basically. When I talk about the distribution between cap the value between capital and labor, well, the market economy has shown its great efficiency. And we're going back to the regulation mechanisms that enable to redistribute part of the wealth, which must be um, governed by the public authorities. So because it's not the private sector, up to the private sector to decide this. And a company dwells, uh, keeps on uh, risking things, seeing what works, what doesn't work. This is what they do permanently. Thank you. We are now with the mayor of Florence, Dario Nardella. So indeed, we're thinking about, uh, he's thinking about the community of his city, the regulation and the acceptability by the population of the rules that you set out. You're a bit uh, for uh, a front runner. You want to reach a carbon free society 10 years before the others. Well, before everything, I think we have to think about today's uh, uh, concept. Making choices is the late motive of today. If we want to have a desirable world, we need to have a world that is capable of making choices. And to make choices, we need to make decisions to own our responsibility. And, and to make decisions, we need to embark the citizens on board, to involve them, local authorities as well. This is my experience as the mayor and the presidents of the uh, European Mayor Society. Governmental authorities are not capable today of making clear-cut and straightforward decisions. What do they do? What do states th uh, do? What did they do during the COP27? What, what kind of decisions were made? What choices were made for the COP during the COP26, during COP25 and COP24? We have no national government capable of making decisions. We need to change the model, the government model. A multi-level government model is essential to have the strength and the capacity to make decisions, but also to involve the citizens. This is why I think, and I think the European mayors are also convinced that the cities are very important to change the world in the way we make decisions. Why? Why cities in Europe? Why are they the problem, but also the solution? We should remind you of a figure. 80% of the world population is concentrated in 3% of the territory, which is the urban territory. But if we look at Europe, we see that European cities are consuming 80% of the available energy. They produce 80% of the waste and 80% of the gas, of carbon gas. However, cities at the same time are drivers for solutions because they can mobilize citizens around new participation approaches. And to have an active particip participation from citizens, we need to mobilize energy on education, participation, cooperation from citizens. And the problem that we see that we have in front of us 
is the society cost in terms of energy transition and climate transition. We always talk about energy transition, climate transition, but never do we talk about societal transition, namely an equitable transition. Our citizens are very much concerned by this uh, cost for the society. If we want to oblige citizens to change their car, to have any electric car, to have a, a non-polluting car, if we want to change our heating system in the private households for families, and we have the inflation rate problem, we have salary problems. So, the citizens cannot be involved with us and cannot rise to the challenge with us, alongside with us. So the matter at hand is the following. We should work all together, hand in hand, public, with the public powers. It's not the central power. It's not the only power. We have also local powers with the stakeholders, the private stakeholders, to share objectives. that would be sustainable objectives. And we need to think out of the European box and think together. We need to have this capacity. If we do not have the capacity to build a new instrument together, a new decision-making instrument, we won't be able to make choices. And without choices, we won't have a desirable world. Maybe some uh, follow-up reactions on what you've just said when you talked about the change of the capitalist world. You wanted to react. Well, the Caisse des Dépôts is an important shareholder of NG, so I guess the discussions to come will definitely be different. But I wanted to say that the, the capitalist system is very plastic, it's very agile. It has shown its capacity to allocate investments at the right, uh, in the right slots. We can see that the business model that is ours is different in terms of energy. And we manage to fund and finance projects. Why? Because the profitability is uh, low, but we have a visibility over a long-term horizon. This is why we justify her, uh, uh, investments. And we manage to have partnerships with uh, people who have uh, a different vision to have financeable projects. And a second comment, the relationship that we have with our shareholders is not only centered around financial bottom lines, but over non-financial results as well. It's very important, including and above all with investors like the Caisse des Dépôts, but not the only one. And that's a time when we can discuss about what we're doing, decarbonation of NG is an important, and it is also, it feeds our discussions. And people say, okay, you're not doing enough. What would be the prerequisites to do more? And they could say, okay, beware of the impact that it could have on your performance. But uh, our discussion is very lively. And it's a form of hope for the future because the financial system is looking for adjustments to a reality that is different today. And shareholders expect from us as stakeholders and those that have a say in the energy tr transition to have a contribution not only in the bottom line, but uh, via a, a wide array of KPIs. You are uh, uh, used to dealing with these contradictions because you have a family tradition, but we also have shareholders at the stock exchange. Which and they rather have a short-term vision. How do you manage to um, strike the right balance between both? Well, indeed, we have a dilemma. All company managers have the same problem. What should we do between the short, mid, and long term? Some are there for the long term, and they are the ones that manage to juggle between the survival of the short-term vision, the capacity to do things in the mid-term, and to develop and ensure long-term implementation. So for this uh, ecologic transition, companies will find the business model. The society will end up finding the right business model. Every time that we develop a new technology, at first it's a disaster. It's a financial disaster. It doesn't work. 
uh, uh, we don't have the scalability, but slowly but surely, if we manage to see that there are markets that are interested and the technology can uh, be fine-tuned and improved, then we have a, an S-curve and we manage to see that things that are collapsing and then there's, it goes up again and, until a peak and a plateau. And in companies, we uh, manage a lot of S-shaped curves. Uh, as for the energy transition, it's another subject, but I'm sure and confident that we are at the beginning. And of course, it, it frightens us. But when we see technologies that date back to 20 years ago, we thought that it would never work. But progressively, we managed to see that it worked. So when it's sustainable, we actually have a portfolio of subjects short-term, mid-term, and long-term subjects, and they juggle between all of them to strike the right balance. And we have to manage to compensate uh, shareholders rightfully, but if you do it at a detriment of employees, it won't work. If you uh, compensate salaries too much at the detriment of shareholders, it won't work either because nobody will invest in your company. So we always have to make both ends meet everywhere. Well. How can we get into this system of capitalism? But also, we need also to be held accountable towards our customers. How do we manage to combine all these components? Well, I would like to comment on, to follow up on what was said. Let's not forget the human being. It's not the planet on the one hand, the technology that will save us. And let's not forget why we do this. It's for the human being. It's for the salaried employees. It's for the cities. Uh, this is why we decarbonate. And let's not forget why we're doing this. Why am I saying this? Because when I talk about salaried employees, the first duty of a company is to have a mini society, to weave a relationship between the different individuals. And we've seen in the past that it's even more important than it used to be in the past. As the CEO, the first thing that I did is to have minimal social requirements for all the Veolia employees. That's one of the examples. We play by, we, 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 we lead by uh, example. And I, I, this is how I act, more than with injunctions. This is how we're going to change the, and, make a, and give a fa facelift to our society. All the French people but it's also the case in everywhere in the world. We're all ready to make efforts on us, but provided some conditions are met. First of all, we need to have equality in terms of efforts. Everyone should work, and it should not be just a small thing that is nice, on, on uh, but without any efficiency, and it should not impact their health. To have a desirable world, we need everyone to be healthy, to live better, and not only with more uh, uh, more quantity, but we need to have better quality. When we talk about human beings, this is essential to build such a world. Thank you. I like this S-shaped uh, curve from Laurent Milano and this reference to 1943, because we have to measure collectively the scope of the uh, challenge ahead of us. The objective is to have a threshold of 1.5 degree in 2100, and for this, we need to be carbon free by 2050. And for this, we have 10 years to implement all the necessary inf investments. We need to have collective endeavors. Nobody should be left on the side. Everybody should be included by all the citizens. And this, is, this requires massive involvement, and this will change everything. When you refer to 1943, we have made huge efforts at the end of World War II in what we call the Trente Glorieuses. And the social pact that uh, defined the Trente Glorieuses, the 30 years after World War II, and you've read it in the history book, certainly you've forgotten it, but it's a social pact whereby there would be a distribution that is much different from uh, what we have today. There's a lot of uh, purchasing power distribution where investors uh, privilege the long-term vision rather than the short-term. The managers were not compensated the way they are now, even though it's not essential. So we have the capacity to do it. But we need to do it by changing the rules in a deep way. 
And it has been said already before, we need a better monitoring of the way companies and board of directors and states work in, on everything that is non-financial. And there's a European directive that will compel everyone to disclose information on financial information. That's an important KPR. But we will also have uh, extra financial monitoring. To give you an example, at the Caisse des de Depots, it's 1,168 situation where each year we will be held accountable, where we will have to report. And that's important to disclose information on the financial results, but also on the impact that we have on the planet. And all these subjects are very important. And I will wrap up by saying that the financiers, the investors, have a major role to play. There's an international alliance of uh, investors, insurance companies, asset managers that, that was uh, created, that was formed. And with some of our public and private partners, we have a dialogue with the Secretary General of the United Nations that considered that f to save the planet, which is also its role, we need all investors of the world to respect this criteria. And they said that investors have an important role to play. Shareholders, investors have a, a role to play in the way that the money will be channeled towards uh, the protection of the planet, which is indispensable for our society. So uh, it's important to involve everyone, employees, but also the new generation. The survey was carried out as well as to the inspirations of the young graduates, may it be in the uh, political science world or the food industry world. Should we rally also uh, the young generation? What do you think about it? There are several considerations, the first of which is that the young generation uh, has a lot of anxiety. There's a central point for the moment. We are much fear focused and we try to be proactive, but we shouldn't have a wrath anger as well, because we have a lot of experiments with an economist from Harvard, Stephen Sanchez, because we should keep a relationship between emotion and acceptability of public policies. When we are going through a climate crisis or a political crisis, when, they are, when people are afraid, they are getting ready to get information. But when they are angry, they don't listen to information anymore. They just hate everything and challenge everything. So we don't have a lot of time ahead of us before we are uh, reaching this tipping point. With the young generation, it is for sure that in two, three years, we've had a strong movement. For a long time, we would show them only, uh, we would uh, raise awareness with the scientific facts. Now, they know much more than we do. And they want to have solutions. When we talk about the fresco of climate or the autumn workshop, they reject it anyway. They want solutions. And then we carried out surface with the young from uh, the uh, business management schools. And we would offer them some solutions and saying, maybe you can find a job where you would earn 20 Ks less, but the company will be more ecologically responsible. Would you opt for that type of company? So uh, we're, we're, to we're talking less about morality here. And what is the answer? Well, they're willing to have 15% discount in their uh, salary, so to say, to have a better responsible company. But, you know, the young, young generation is diversified. We have several youth uh, segments. When we talk about business management schools, we see them HEC, X, and so on. But within these uh, communities, when you have people from business management schools, when they have to pay for their studies rather than parents paying for it, then we have a different view, a different perspective. But you have also vocational school students where they have a perspective that is different on society. So making both ends meet on the one hand and saving the planet on the other hand, yeah. So we should not focus too much on this youth. We should also understand the underprivileged youth where the issues at hand are much more complex. Indeed, these issues are not always solved. And sometimes an answer is not found to these issues. So you also are facing uh, thousands of talents every day, every year. What is going to happen in 10 years, in 20 years? And the planners is part of the, the issues to tackle. 
what are you talking about with your employees on that subject? Well, we're very lucky because we're very attractive at Veolia for these young graduates because of the work we do, but because also of the consistency in which we're having our operations. We're not perfect, but we try to improve on a daily basis. We understand and we manage to uh, be true to our words and to walk the talk, basically. So sometimes we, when we talk about the youth, what are we talking about? All the studies that we carried out show that the youth is not less interested uh, by energy transition than the older uh, age groups. But then there's something about the under 18 age group that is the younger people. And we have to mobilize the young people, but not only the young people. And where I would like to follow up on what you have said, they don't want, they want evidence. They don't just want empty words. They want something concrete. So a desirable, yes, a desirable world, yes. They want to be, they want to find in the world that we're building enticing. Where they don't want prohibitions. They want to have something that is desirable, but it needs to be possible. We shouldn't just make them dream. We should show them the way. They want to build together with us. We should co-build the, 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 the path towards solutions, technological society, but also frugality. When we talk about frugality, they talk about sufficiency, which is not uninteresting. How much do I really need, and not more, to produce the same outcome? I think that the term is quite more interesting, actually. So as far as I'm concerned, Ecological transformation is not uh, something that we rule. We need to do it, and we need to do it now. So when we look at the track record of a, an energy company which specializes in gas, how can we dream? Well, I think we have to explain in concrete terms that energy wants to be the leader in climate transition, energy transition. And so that there are some very obvious things, five to six billion euros invested every year in renewables. Five to six billion is, uh, is a, a, a substantial amount of money. And to show colleagues who work with us in gas, and we all need gas, we're all very, very happy. Uh, when we need to have to turn our heating on, that the teams are all out there and can provide the energy that we all need. This gas, well, we want to make it greener. And this is something which is very motivating for our teams. We've got hundreds and hundreds, soon thousands of collection points of biogases. We've got methanizers, which you can see out in the countryside, which are going to inject into our network locally produced gas from waste and uh, in a business which is kind of substantial in size, hundreds of thousands of employees today. We, it's important to understand how each individual contributes to the collective goal, and that means a lot of communication by management, uh, intermediary levels, the top management as well. They need to inspire and they need to show that we are being active. And the fact of being active is so important. I think today we know how, emergent, how urgent the situation is. There's lots of analyses been carried out. Situations are being developed. They do exist. We have to manage to speed things up. And we will speed up by uh, motivating all of our teams and showing each individual what their contribution is. Our employees are challenging us on these themes, and they're right to do so. They drive us to go faster. Eric Lombard, you are in the center of all of this country that is going through transformation. You've got local councils. You've got your employees. The stakeholders for you. Uh, need to be perhaps uh, convinced of this. No, they are convinced, and we are managing to uh, uh, recruit people to the case and to our subsidiaries. The payment is perhaps lower than in the private sector. Because there's a question, I just want to give an example here, which I found very, very enlightening, and it enables me to say a couple of words about uh, policies in towns. So we've got this town policy, the city policies, which we've been talking about recently. In this policy, there's a development over recent years, i.e. to uh, foster uh, collective living, uh, apartment blocks, etc. These are um, social housing associations. There are 700 or less, I think, now in France. But it's all very centralized, whilst being local. So co-owned properties are areas and the actual minister was used to be the mayor of Clichy in the Paris region where things uh, didn't go so very well. When people didn't have enough um, money to pay the rent, then the whole 
everything crumbled. We saw that in Marseille most recently. So uh, we had an initiative to renovate these uh, um, co-owned properties that were not up to scratch. Uh, we asked for help from uh, P uh, the police, etc. When there are these um, P uh, uh, property owners who would profit from the underprivileged in Marseille, for example, there was a, a, an area called Parc Chanou. There we created a business plan. It was presented in my office. We don't have stakeholders, or, but we have to all the same have to be profitable in order to survive and to grow. And when I was presented with this project, the subject was uh, was uh, making a loss, and we realized that we had to get back into equilibrium. But uh, they're saying, you know, it's so important. So we can see how questions of meaning are uh, drivers. They're very motivational, and they mean that we can get youngsters on board. And I just want to say, in our country, we have a lot of elected representatives because for the general good, they are night and day out in the field with their uh, electors, and even more so in recent days. And I just want to say a few words because uh, uh, city uh, policies are very contested today. If we say things uh, simply, since Jean-Louis Borloo launched his plan, there have been ups and downs, of course. There are some sections which have been renovated a lot. There's a lot of work being carried out to provide more public services to help entrepreneurship in the different neighborhoods, and it's all moving forward. Let's not be defeatist here. It's all advancing. However, what is actually happening? Well, because it works, there are many people who are advancing, who know how to make their way up the ladder, they leave their neighborhood, they are replaced. Because we have a lot of migrants and immigrants coming into France, they are replaced by new arrivals who they themselves may be in even more difficult situations. And so the social standing isn't really changing very much. And that is what we're um, experiencing that, but it's not a failure. We have to continue to work to enhance housing and services, etc. We've noted also that whilst it's dim difficult to manage towns and cities, the tensions that do exist, particularly among the young, who are angry, then sometimes it can spill over. I'm not saying this to apologize, to make apologies for their actions, but I think that our town and city policies do have some positive effects, and these policies do work. They do what they were designed to do. So we've been talking about uh, Michelin's aims earlier on, Florent Menego. Well, if you offer people a transaction, oh, you do a job and I'll pay you a salary. Well, that's not enough anymore. To motivate uh, a group of people, a uh, business has to be a social platform. These are individuals who are working together. Nobody's forcing them to come to your company. So when you want to motivate them, and I echo what I said earlier on, you have to enable them to see, look forward to the future towards this collective dream. At Michelin, we've got our collective dream, not rave as the interpreter said earlier on, but a collective dream. We That's what gets us all active and makes us able to make choices. We can uh, become active and then there's so much coherency in our action to fine-tune or to align up our actions with our concepts. So we don't have any problem with uh, attractiveness. We can attract people. We can keep employees as well because each individual is born to progress. And when you offer them a framework that enables them to express and deploy their talents, well, quite naturally, that person will go and do what they were born to do. Earlier on, you mentioned that disbalance between remuneration for the work of capital. Have we shifted? Have we gone too far? Yeah, I do want to, join, to say I agree with what Estelle said. It's not a minimum wage which we're talking about here in other countries. We have defined minimum social uh, contributions around the world because there are some countries where there are no so there's no social aid. If there's a death, your family is left with nothing. And so we had to balance things out again. And in our contract, we say we have to balance between the remuneration of the, uh, the smallest wages and the highest wages. Everybody has to have a minimum amount of social protection. And a decent wage is not just a survival wage. A wage, we've defined it with, two, for example, two, pe two parents, two children. A salary must enable each member of that family to be able to save, to have housing, to eat 
to go on holiday, to access culture, a minimum amount of things. And we did it not by saying that, that we're defining all this. We used uh, NGOs who are specialized in this to define what the minimum is. And since we've done that, of course, the commitment rate of people at Michelin, when you take them away from this survival mode and put them in this new mode, well, of course, yes, they're there. They're happy to come to work because they know that this uh, finance which goes alongside work, that contract is uh, completed and respected. So mayors play an important role, of course, for social cohesion. We see that, uh, we've seen that in, in France in recent days, and we can see how things can become uh, uh, out of order. Yes, French mayors are uh, committed in this uh, very difficult social situation here in France, but the, sa the same all over in Europe. And talking about the new generations, I think, as you've already said, that the new generations are more sensitive to these major global challenges. There's a climate change, social inclusion, social inequalities, all of the problems which we've underlined here. But this generation is also very vulnerable, very fragile. And if you, uh, you, you need to start a dialogue with these youngsters. You need to listen to them. We need to talk to the young generations. If you don't do that, the risk will be that this social vulnerability will change into social anger. Most of these social demonstrations that we're seeing here in France and in other European countries, all of these demonstrations mainly have their roots uh, in uh, the, the new generations. In Italy, I carried out some research into post-pandemic generations and their needs and the expectations of young Italians in the period after COVID. And this was a, a questionnaire which was uh, carried out, a survey which was carried out. And I was very interested to note in this uh, research that youngsters are, remain heavily impacted by the uh, health care crisis, which continues around the world due to COVID. And this report uh, talks about youngsters who, between the ages of 17 and 36, they highlighted the fragility and the vulnerability of children and young adults who, uh, in the first months of 2021, saw a radical change in their lifestyles, in their professional outlook and their social relations. That's compared to the desirable world. The desirable world for the younger generations is, sadly, a world with a lot of problems. I think once again, collaboration at national and local levels to talk to the new generation is absolutely key. Um, I want to uh, tell you a story. You may have heard it before, but last April in Florence, just by chance, I was on Piazza della Senora. It's uh, before the Bishop's Palace there, where my office is, and. It's not where I live, sadly, but it's where my office is, and that's not such a, a shoddy place. So you're all really, very welcome to come and visit me in my office. <laughs> so there was a demonstration of ecologists, the European uh, last generation movement. It was like Friday for the future. And there were boys who threw paint onto the walls of the bishop's palace. I was there by chance. And so I, I started to prevent the youngsters from doing that. And I became very famous in Italy because of that. Because I, I was speaking the previous week with the youngsters, I was saying to them, you must not uh, stain culture to heighten the awareness of uh, civil society about questions of uh, climate urgent problems. We, public administrators, we, politicians, must find situations to talk with the new generation in Europe because they represent this social anger. 
and we have to invest a lot of energy to avoid that this social vulnerability transforms into something which is quite serious for our society. Thank you very much. Yes, we need all of uh, the talents of Yann Allegan to sum all of that up in just a matter of minutes. Well, sadly, we haven't got time to take questions, but that being said, we had a very rich debate here. And it really does sketch out solutions. It shows that there's a lot of action already underway in businesses. Uh, starting by the Caisse de Depot, we have shown the extent to which the accessibility, accessi the acceptability of projects is so key for projects to succeed. We need businesses, uh, private individuals, and everyone to be involved, including the young generation. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here, and thank you to our panel members.